Good morning. The October 19th Board of Education meeting is now in session. Please rise for the invocation. O oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance, stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. The pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Item 2.03 is the approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion to approve our minutes? I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Minutes have been approved. Item 2.04 is establishing agenda order and the agenda will stand as published. Item 2.05 are recognitions. We have Ms. Cicero. Stacy, before you go ahead on the minute, can I go to page seven of the minutes for a moment? On item 2.03? Yes. I would like to request, I still have not received the report from the administration in order to basically present the facts as far as the gas is concerned. Okay, So, the, but the minutes themselves are okay. Yeah, the minutes themselves are okay. Okay. Thank you, Marie. Ms. Cicero. Good morning. I'm Gail Cicero, the Director of Student Services. And with me is Chloe Constance, representing the Olivia Constance Foundation. We are pleased to be here to present this morning's recognition. But before we begin, I'd like to ask members of the board and Dr. Alato to please come forward. The Constance Foundation is more than a partner with Anne Arundel County Public Schools, but rather they're part of our extended family who provides resources that support our core values. In particular, the foundation, in memory of late Broadneck High School student Olivia Constance, continues to sponsor a student competition related to eliminating bullying in our schools. In addition, the Constance Foundation continues to provide grants to schools, which provide a number of services to support marginalized youth, and they're designed to build the capacity of young people to make a difference in the world. The Constance Foundation continues to live its mission every day, which reads, to do all the good we can for whomever we can in the spirit of Olivia. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chloe. Good morning. As Gail said, I'm Chloe Constance, and I'm very glad to be here this morning. The Olivia Constance Foundation was started in the fall of 2011 in memory of my sister, Olivia Constance, a Broadneck High School student who lost her life at the age of 14 from a tragic sailing accident here in Annapolis. Our mission statement is to do all the good we can for whomever we can in the spirit of Olivia. We were moved to start the foundation partly because of Olivia's larger-than-life personality. Her sweet deposition, her contagious laugh, her love for life, and the way she valued and treasured her relationships and friendships. The foundation does a number of things, including scholarship and grant opportunities. We started working with the school system to provide grants to support anti-bullying initiatives in the school feeder system. Gail has worked with us from day one to help us communicate the opportunities that were available. We have great kids in our county, and we are excited tonight to unveil the winners of our third Anti-Bullying Through the Arts. Gail, if you would please announce the winners and their foundations that OCF will support on behalf of the students who will come forward as their names are called. Bryn. Kathleen 
Schlesinger. I hope I got that right, Brim. A seventh grade student at Severn River Middle School. Her artwork is titled Words Online. And her charity that will be supported is the Liam Lighthouse Foundation. Our second winner is Carly Goldman from Chesapeake Bay Middle School. Her artwork is titled The Wall and her charity is UNICEF. Thank you. All right, item 2.06 is Educator of the Month, Mrs. Birch. Thank you. Today, the Board of Education honors an educator in our school system who has a passion for teaching math. Her classes allow over 100 struggling math students to experience a different approach to learning at MacArthur Middle School. Ashley Vittorio uses differentiation strategies in her classroom to make sure that she reaches all of her students. She has the ability to take the math standards and design a well-executed lesson that incorporates the CRA instructional approach, an intervention for mathematics instruction that enhances student achievement. Her classroom is alive with cooperative assignments, discovery techniques, and appropriate technology. Mrs. Vittorio's students are always focused on learning and sharing ideas. Mrs. Vittorio adjusts her lessons and practices based on data analysis and her students' responsiveness. She pre-assesses to identify areas of need and then builds up student confidence by using smaller skill sets. Ashley is very creative and loves to share new ideas and improve on old ones. Her energy, organizational skills, and love for teaching is a source of encouragement and guidance for all those with whom she works. Ashley is a balanced, caring educator who is also open-minded and a risk taker. She participates in all professional development and utilizes what she's learned in her classroom. She communicates regularly with students, parents, teachers, and staff. Mrs. Vittorio is a highly effective reflective practitioner who constantly examines her teaching practices. Her ability to self-evaluate and make changes based on her reflection makes her a master teacher. She is a true student advocate who involves students and parents in educational decisions. She is determined to make sure that her students are successful. Ask any student in Ashley's math class and they will tell you they love the one-on-one -on -one attention. Her students like learning about the math material in smaller steps and different ways and because of this, they are successful. Ashley took on the performance and math intervention program to ensure that her students had the extra time and opportunity to master math standards. As a member of the Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports Committee, she is always thinking about the school improvement plan as she creates her lessons, effectively implementing the Kids at Hope philosophy and PBIS strategies in her classroom. 
Ashley Vittorio, your positive attitude, perseverance, and work ethic make you a true model at MacArthur Middle School. And for these reasons and more, the board is honored to recognize you as Educator of the Month for October 2016. Congratulations and please join me up front. Item 2.07 is Employee of the Month, Mr. Gilliland. Thank you, Madam President. As many of you know, last week, October 10th through the 14th, was National School Lunch Week. Created by President John F. Kennedy in 1962, National School Lunch Week is a week-long celebration of the school lunch program. This year, the theme is Show Your Spirit, reminding parents, students, and school officials that a healthy school lunch helps students power through the day. And today, the board is asking everyone to show their spirit for our employee of the month, North County High School's food service manager, Michael McLaughlin. Michael is... Michael is an innovator and a problem solver when it comes to completing his job-related tasks. He is known for all of his work the past several years embracing the initiative of providing breakfast in classrooms for all students and helping the school participate in the school breakfast challenge. Not only does he ensure that breakfast is provided in the morning to Cat North students, he can be seen in the bus parking lot with breakfast on hand for those students. <clears throat> He has provided a wonderful taste of North County at freshman orientation night, showcasing the healthy meal options for, for parents to observe. Michael is dedicated to the wellness of the entire school community, from ensuring the Cat North bus drivers receive breakfast to helping custodians shoveling snow off of sidewalks. All would agree that he goes above and beyond in his job responsibilities. He's even participated in the school's homecoming parade by escorting the superintendent and North County High School's principal in his convertible. It's nice. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin is always a positive presence at North County with his personable demeanor, a friendly way of addressing staff and students by their names. He ensures that staff are welcomed each morning to fresh fruit in the mailroom and the office always has a tray of healthy breakfast items available. Michael is a troubleshooter. Two-hour delay, testing causes relocate, classroom le relocations, no problem. He has a seamless plan in place for students to receive breakfast. Whether staffers need last-minute lunches for field trips or it's overwhelmingly hot in the cafeteria, Michael always remains calm and professional. When students become frustrated in line because they thought they were to receive free lunch, he works to de-escalate the situation and he helps the student understand the process for re receiving free and reduced meals. Michael McLaughlin, you truly embody the spirit of North County High School. Healthy students make successful students and the role you play at your school is a critical one. So on behalf of the Board of Education, the students, teachers, and staff of the Anne Arundel County Public Schools, congratulations on being recognized as educator, uh, as employee of the month for October 2016. Yes. 
<laughs> Lunch bell for you. Okay. If you ring that, it'll come running. And then we've got a uh, certificate here for you. And is anyone here from our town? Uh, Mrs. McVeigh, assistant principal. Okay. How'd she get here? What did you think you were doing? Uh, just to talk about our successes at North County and how many lunches we're serving. How many are you serving? Close to a thousand a day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Volunteer of the Month, Mr. Granin. Thank you, President Korbelak. Is my mic on? Yeah. At this time, the, the board is proud to present this award to the uh, Anne Arundel County Public Schools Volunteer of the Month to Kathy Schaffer, who volunteers at Hillsme Hillsmere Elementary School. Passionate, dedicated, driven, talented, a leader. These are just a few of the words used by many in the Hillsmere Elementary community to describe an extraordinary volunteer. Today, the Board of Education is proud to honor Ms. Kathy Schaffer as October's Volunteer of the Month. Hillsmere Principal Jesse Mitchell wrote appreciatively, Mrs. Schaffer's great service and contributions have had a tremendous impact on both our students and the greater school community. Mrs. Schaffer co-founded the Hillsmere Publishing Company or HPC, a school-based volunteer-run organization that is committed to having every child at Hillsmere write, publish, and present a book. Her mission is to ensure every student sees him or herself as a published writer, and her enthusiasm has created a school-wide culture of self-assurance and confidence. Kathy oversees all aspects of the HPC program. She mobilizes a team of volunteers and then trains, <clears throat> trains them to coach and edit the student writers. She types student drafts at home and assembles each student's book. Kathy arranges for events at the Annapolis Barnes and Noble and the public library to showcase the students' books, and she ensures the young writers have opportunities to meet and learn from published adult authors. Mrs. Schaffer is indeed Hillsmere's great communicator. She writes The Buzz, an electronic weekly newsletter, maintains the school's PTA Facebook page, and prepares morning announcement messages. She even creates flyers for the numerous school events, including the ones she organizes herself, such as last year's holiday party at the Robinswood Recreational Center. At this event, children and their families enjoyed singing carols, listening to stories, crafts, games, and snacks, all thanks to Kathy Schaffer's talent uh, to bring the community together. From the Hillsmere Elementary Fun Fair to the Muffins for Mom and Donuts for Dad events, Kathy Schaffer ensures each event she's involved with is a huge success. Last but not least, Mrs. Schaffer generously volunteers her extensive marketing experience to write, produce, and host The Parents' Corner, a monthly 15-minute show on the Anne Arundel, Anne Arundel County Public School cable TV and YouTube channels. Principal Mitchell writes that Kathy Schaffer epitomizes the saying, those who can do, those who can do more, volunteer. And volunteer she does. Ms. Schaffer, would you please come forward?
And we will be taking pictures of all of our awardees at the break shortly. Item 2.09 are school and community highlights. Mrs. Hummer. Um, yes, it's been a busy time since the last meeting that we had. Um, October 1st, I w was able to attend the county PTA um, workshop um, at the Carver Center where we had a PTA officers come in and we had a fabulous speaker from Montgomery County and that was a great event. Um, got everyone fired up to start PTA for the year. Um, last week I attended the Special Education Resource Fair which is just a great um, event for all of our uh, parents and families with children with special needs. All the resources available in the county inside the school system and out were there and um, it was just an, an abundance of information available to everyone and more food and candy than you can imagine. My daughter said she was trick-or-treating because they had so many good things. So, um, Last week was Hispanic Heritage Week and I had the pleasure of being a guest reader at um, Brockbridge Elementary School and um, the uh, some of our Spanish speaking students were nice enough to help me with Spanish words so they they helped be the reader with me and they had a fabulous local author Raul Cisneros who came and read his book to some of the students he's written a book Raul and the Iguana that is um, in English and Spanish and so that was a great um, resource and activity for the kids to see a real life author um, read to them and then last week, Ms. Pickard from the County PTA and Dr. Alato and I had the pleasure of attending Schools and Courts, um, which is a program that we hold four times a year where different classes from different high schools come in and get to see court in session. And the judge is great in talking to the kids about the choices, making good choices, and um, the impact that can happen in the court system if you don't make good choices. Um, it was very powerful and fun and it's just an amazing um, um, collaboration that we have with the court systems and so hats off to our social studies department for implementing that for over a decade now and um, the court, the head judge told us that they're looking to expand it statewide because they believe it's such a valuable thing. So um, again, hats off to our social studies department for such a great resource. Ms. Sasso. Once again, like Julie mentioned, it was the Hispanic Heritage Month, and uh, I was graciously invited to speak at two of the schools, the Lindale Elementary School at their lunch, the faculty and administration lunch, and the other one was basically at the Chesapeake Science Point School, that they had an activity for all of the Hispanic families that were, their children were taking the Hispanic class, and they were two very, very outstanding programs. Ms. Williams. Uh, last Wednesday, the Biomedical Allied Health Program had their first family night of the school year, and I just wanted to shout out Ms. Golden, who is our new coordinator. It was a fantastic night. We had three different guest speakers. There were Biomedical Allied Health students from all grades that showed up, so it was a great event. Dr. Frank. As an <clears throat> excuse me, as an engineer, uh, I wanted to uh, bring something uh, uh, forward that is important to me, and I hope it's important to you. Uh, it's not going on in this state, but it's going on in our neighboring state. And the subject I want to talk about is the pumpkin chunkin. I hope you're familiar with the pumpkin chunkin because it is an opportunity to see how far someone else can throw a pumpkin. So I hope you will go to our neighboring state uh, on uh, uh, next, next week uh, and uh, enjoy yourself. And uh, uh, remember that's uh, one, one reason you want to study engineering. We also, uh, many of us on the board had a chance to go to the May professional development session in Ocean City last or last week, 10 days ago or so. Uh, we had three days of sessions with, um, including our state superintendent. We just had an opportunity to sort of get our own professional development to learn about what's going on around the state, which is fantastic. And then we left there and we drove to Teacher of the Year 
banquet in Baltimore, and unfortunately, Anne Arundel had a finalist, but Baltimore City beat us out. But we'll try again next year. All right, item 2.10 is the CROSC report. Good morning, President Korbelak, Dr. Arlotto, and members of the board. My name is Christina Dyson, and I am the second vice president of the Chesapeake Regional Association of Student Councils. This past week has been the busiest week we've had this year. During our recent meetings, we have worked to revise our constitution and continue to discuss student issues. This past Saturday, CRAS students presented a panel discussion at the Leadership Development Institute here at the Carroll Parham Building following a presentation by Delegate Pam Bible. The student panel talked about student inclusion, lobbying legislative officials, and partnering with influential groups, as well as answering various questions from the attendees. A special thank thanks to Ms. Dorley's Boston, Ms. Jasmine Coleman, and former CRASC President Emma Grayville for assisting with the Maryland General Assembly page program interviews, which took place yesterday. 24 students interviewed for 10 spots, as well as two alternate spots for this program. Our CRASC executive staff meeting tonight will focus exclusively on preparing for our event tomorrow. At 6 o'clock tomorrow night, a guest list of 75 students and legislators will assemble at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation Merrill Center for the first annual Youth Vision and Voice Dinner and Discussion with the student leaders of Anne Arundel County. The following morning, on the 21st, CRASC students will also present another panel discussion, this time on the education gap to assistant principals at the Unlocking Our Minds, Growing Ourselves to Grow Others conference. We are excited for our upcoming events and our, the rest of our endeavors throughout the rest of the school year. Thank you. Thank you. Item 2.11 is the CAC report, but I understand we don't have one today. And 2.12 is the PTA report. Good morning, President Korbelak, Dr. Arlato, and members of the board. My name is Allison Pickard, and I'm currently serving as president of Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs. I bring some positive news uh, from efforts this uh, October regarding PTA activities. On Saturday, October 1st, we held our annual fall general membership meeting and leadership training. We had over 40 PTA leaders coming to get trained on um, their new roles as presidents and treasurers, and also some hot topics like hazards of social media, drugs in our communities, Advocacy 101, which is my big push this year, and um, our Reflections program. The, the sessions were all very well attended, but the most compelling part of our morning was our keynote speaker that addressed the group over breakfast, uh, Mr. Oscar Alvarenga, who is currently the Montgomery County PTA President of the Year. And he received that honor by the tremendous amount of work he's done at his elementary school, um, Summit Hill in Gaithersburg, to, um, I stopped reading my speech, <laughs> started talking. Um, he's done a tremendous uh, effort to bring intentional inclusion to their school community. And I could not get his presentation out of my head. So he spoke to our leaders like only a PTA president, a Hispanic male parent in an elementary school could. He talked about the work, um, getting out of your comfort zone, making your PTA and your members and parent participation reflect the school community that you serve, um, it might, you might not know this, but PTAs can be cliquish. <laughs> and he really challenged our group to think outside the box, look at your school, see who's participating, see who's um, active, and see who needs extra help in making that leap. He has increased his participation at monthly meetings. I mean, listen up, PTAs, monthly meetings to about 75 parents. They come. They hear topics, they talk about school, they talk about parent engagement, and because of these efforts, every student group in that school, every student group has seen increased academic achievement. Like I said, I haven't lost it. So with that, 
we have launched, the Council of PTAs has launched an uh, intentional inclusion challenge for all 90 of our PTAs, well really 89, 90 coming, <laughs> um, all 90 of our PTAs to take some time between now and April and think about three, three things, three initiatives that they could take on, simple things, to change their PTA leadership, increase the diversity in the leadership and membership. Who are they not reaching? Who's not involved? Who needs to be involved? And what kinds of creative things can they do to reach that population? With that, we're asking that our PTAs um, capture these moments on social media, in the newsletter, um, send us um, ideas, send us how they've gone, if they've gone well, if they didn't go as well, and we'll share them um, with all of our other PTAs. And one PTA, one hardworking creative PTA will win a $200 grant from the council to celebrate their efforts at the end of the year. All that information can be found on our website, which brings me to my next very exciting um, item to report. And the Council of PTAs has spent this fall updating our website. I'll be honest, 1998 or 1996 doesn't seem that long ago, but that's the last time our website had been touched. So <laughs> it was really a long time ago, actually. Um, but we have cleaned it up. It's easy to navigate. It's clean. It's fresh. But the most important thing is it's a fantastic resource for our members. Um, you can click on, you can learn about us. Sorry, Diana. Um, and we have upcoming events. And at the very bottom, you'll see PTA compliance. PTAs can go there and find out exactly what they need to do to stay in good standing with Maryland PTA, which is often, um, you know, it's very important to remain in good standing. And then it lists all the things that we do as a council, which is mainly to support our local PTAs. And soon you'll see um, the announcement about our scholarships. So they'll be up in November. But I'm really excited about our advocacy tab. And you can, our, <clears throat> both our members and our leader, PTA leadership, can go right through that tab and um, be able to address all decision makers at every level. They can access the BOE policy page if they want to see what's happening right here in this room monthly. Or they could, uh, if they want to reach out to the county executive, they can click that tab and go right to his page. Um, we're really hoping to engage more parents and PTA members in advocacy, and this is a great, uh, there's lots of resources on our website. So that is my report, and next month we'll be talking scholarships. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna take a break now to take some pictures of the Educator, Employee, and Volunteer of the Month, and we'll be back soon.
right, we're going to move to the public participation portion of the meeting. Anyone wishing to speak on an item that is not on today's agenda may offer testimony during this portion of the meeting. Speakers will be allotted three minutes each, and the board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing the meeting. Student-specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. This time is intended for speakers to voice their opinion and not necessarily as a question and answer period. Speakers may pose questions, but answers will be counted toward the three-minute allotment. If you're here with, if you're here representing a group, please select a spokesperson and have the remainder of your group stand while that person speaks. For the record, please give your name before speaking and handouts should be given to the board assistant. I've got several cards. I'll call up the first five. Lee Derrick, Carol McGillan, Louis Biondi, Deborah Morrison, and Tony Pratt. Good morning. Uh, good morning, President Korbelak, Dr. Arlotto, and board members. My name is Lee Derrick. I'm a South County resident. I was raised in Galesville, graduated from Southern High School. I attended Lothian Elementary. Very involved down there. I'm in the South County Rotary, past president there. I'm also a past president of the Southern High School Business and Community Advisory Board. And I'm also very involved in my church. I'm the finance chair of Galesville United Methodist. Our Rotary Club currently is providing lunches for 150 students that are free, uh, they're on free lunch. This is through the Kerry Whedon uh, Science Center, and that's what I'm here to talk about, the repurposing of that. I tell you this, all of these uh, items about myself, because I want you to realize the, the pride and the energy I have for South County. I'm very, very motivated to help the students to do what I can to support the area. So turning my attention to the MGT report that was, I believe this group, you guys should be familiar with it. It was commissioned by Anne Arundel uh, County Public Schools. And it basically looked at the buildings uh, in the entire, encompassing all of Anne Arundel County Public Schools. It looked at all sorts of information, including demographic projections. And Lothian, which is where all of my kids, my one son is just recently out of, but my other three are also in currently. Um, Lothian, which is a brand new building, it's beautiful. You guys did a great job on the building. According to the MGT study, and I can attest personally, it's about 100 students short of full utilization. Uh, the repurposing of Kerry Whedon, the idea there is to repurpose that structure for a pre-K. Now, Lothian currently has a pre-K program. As a business person, I'm a local business person, I feel strongly about making sure taxpayer dollars are, are leveraged as best they can. and I feel the administration at Lothian could be utilized to facilitate an increase in the numbers in lieu of the Kerry Whedon Science Center repurposing, which would include construction cost, additional administration, additional teachers there that I don't feel is necessary and we would be in the best interest of the taxpayers. Additionally, I would comment, and this is very, very important because you'll hear other things from other people about this. If you talk to individuals at, Kerry, at Lothian, there are families of means whose students are utilizing the pre-K program. I fully want to support the farms students as best we can. I really do. But I also want to make sure that the data that you're hearing is accurate. There have been many, many families, some of which I know all of you know, that have used the pre-K program there and used taxpayer money to send their students to a free education facility. They should be using private facilities. That's one of my major questions, is how are we going to make sure that the farm students are the ones that are using it and that we don't have these wealthy families that are taking advantage of it as they are currently. Another reason for me to make sure that Lothian, which could be a much lower cost idea, that you could try that first. If it's very successful, then let's expand to Kerry Whedon. Thank you. Carol? Good morning. Um, my name is Carol McGillan Grieve, and my husband and I have lived in the county for the past 16 years. Uh, I'm here to assure you that we are both in support of the board transgender student guidelines that you have recently released. These guidelines are based on facts 
accurate medical psychological understanding of transgender students and best education policy. I'm here because unfortunately some of our political leaders in the county are trying to change this into a political issue driving fear and division within the county. Um, this is ultimately an issue of discrimination and ensuring our schools are safe places for all students to learn. There was a recent letter to the editor um, in the Capitol with, which I think expressed strongly why your guidelines and, and are so important. There may be people who are uncomfortable around transgender people, but discomfort alone is not an excuse for discrimination, as we learned in dealing with the rights of people of color, handicapped, gay persons, and women. Laws can't enforce anyone to be open-minded and compassionate, but they can define discrimination and offer legal remedies. Some have said that the guidelines from the board are unnecessary and extreme. Actually, this is not correct. Um, the National Association of School Board uh, Secondary Principals, a nonpartisan education group, has come out with guidance, which I believe some of what you've said is based on, to help school principals who've been asking for guidance in terms of dealing with this evolving and important issue. The, the National Association of Secondary School Principal Guiding Principals portray the kind of education setting that I know I want for all children, including my 14 nieces and nephews, seven grandchildren, and what I expect from our school board leader and government leaders to ensure. So in ending, one of the key guidelines that I think you all reflect is that we need to support our principals to create and sustain a, a school environment in which each school, each student is known, accepted, and valued trusted and cared for. The principal must support a school environment where diversity is valued and accepted. We support the school board and expect, as you do here, that we will continue to make decisions, you'll continue to make decisions based on facts and ensure that all children in Anne Arundel County have the kind of school environment that does value, cherish, and protect all students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lou. President Corbelak, Superintendent Arlotto, members of the board, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Louis Biondi. I'm president of the Goshen Farm Preservation Society Incorporated, and we operate the historic Ocean Farm and Educational Center, which we lease from the Board of Education. Um, in the last 18 months, we have served 500 students at Goshen Farm. Just this morning, we got an email from Gail Davis at Broadneck High School with the AVID program that she is redesigning her program to incorporate Goshen Farm as an educational resource. We've poured hundreds, well, $140,000 into rehabilitating the facility. We've provided security. We've improved the road so school buses can get up to the farm. And all of this without a dime from the Board of Education or Anne Arundel County Public Schools. We recently were recognized as a community business partner by the 21st uh, Century Education Foundation. About, uh, well, several months ago, we had requested a memorandum of understanding modification to our lease to put us more in line with the Maryland, um, Maryland Hall, Center for the Arts. Uh, this would help us raise funds and continue to expand our educational outreach efforts to Broadneck High School to Cape St. Clair Elementary, and to many other schools on the Broadneck. And I'm just here to ask for an update on the status of that memorandum of understanding. Every, every week that goes by limits our planning for fundraising events and other activities that could help us help the students of Anne Arundel County. Thank you. Hi, my name is Deborah Morrison. I am a parent at Hillsmere Elementary School. And I just wanted to come and speak a little bit about the um, plan for next year to shift elementary schools another 15 to 20 minutes um, after our school has already been shifted 10 minutes this year. So now we're talking about a 30 minute shift, a 930 start time for elementary schools. And my biggest concern is have you taken in consideration medicated kids? So a child who's being medicated, who may have, uh, like my child who is ADHD, who is medicated at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, by two, or, by two o'clock, really, I mean, even though it's an extended release, he is not as functioning as he could be at the prime 
part of his uh, his medication. So another, you know, a 30 minute shift in a two year period makes a huge difference, especially if they're getting, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to know that, it, at, you know, before care, my kid is going to be perfectly medicated and well behaved, but probably when he's getting, you know, reading or anything that, like that, he's, you know, climbing off walls. So I just really want you to have a, another consideration about shifting all the elementary schools should not, it should not be across the board, all elementary schools being shifted. I know that there are bus route issues, um, not only on top of us being shifted another 15 to 20 minutes. We have, I live two miles from the school. Our kids get home 50 minutes after school is ended. So now you're talking about children who are going to be walking off the bus at 4.45, 4.50 in the evening. So a concern of, again, are kindergartners safe walking home in the middle of the winter in the dark? Because it is dark by that point. So there, not only is it the shift of the time, it's that we're a late bus for two miles away from the school. Children who are not going to be safe getting off, elementary school kids who are not going to be off the, you know, be safe getting off the bus. You know, and I could say in the same sense, our high schoolers who are on the bus stop at 6.15 in the morning, I have seen them standing, 6.15 in the morning standing to wait for a bus is, is unacceptable as well. So I just really wanted to come up and talk to you about, I know that you guys have busing software that has not been implemented. How are you going to use that busing and, and to rework an appropriate start time, not just for my kid, but for all of the elementary school kids, all of the, the high school kids that are standing on bus stops or getting off bus stops at inappropriate times? That's it, thank you. Tony. Good morning, um, President Corley, are back. Um, Mr. Alato and the board members. My name is Tony Pratt, and I'm here speaking on be. I'm a parent of um, Anne Arundel County student, and I'm here to speak on the uniform policy. Um, this year, I'm raising my granddaughter, and I have two granddaughters who attend two different schools. One school which wears uniforms, and one school which doesn't wear uniform. So I was inclined to find out, well, I didn't know that. I thought the whole county wore uniforms until then. So I wanted to find out what the policy was and why this was. So I started in Annapolis to research who wore uniforms. So upon my research, it was astounding and very disheartening because I found in Annapolis, the majority students who were wearing uniforms were minority schools. I did the research for all, but not in. But it's not in high school. Um, you know, I don't. Would you? Could you take statistics instead of going on to calculus? You know, that kind of thing. Yes, you you may. Students are required to take algebra one and geometry, and then the other two credits can be an elective. Okay. So that is their choice. So you don't have to keep going. You don't have to end up in calculus if calculus isn't what you were meant to do. Correct. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, just to comment, the rigorous language that's inserted there, that's from the Maryland College and Career Readiness and College Completion Act of 2013. So that's why that language was added, because it did sort of up in that they wanted to say that it needs to be a rigorous course. So that's sort of the concept there. Correct. Is there any public comment on this item? <laughs> All right, so we'll post that also for 30 days. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> item 4.05 is an information to action item, George Cromwell Elementary School Revitalization Design Development. Do I have a motion to move this from information to action? Second. All those in favor? We now have an action item. Dr. Olato, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend approval of the George Cromwell Elementary School Revitalization Design Development. Do I have a motion? <laughs> so moved. <laughs> okay, Mrs. Sasso. I would like to ask Teresa, before we go into all of these school systems, Teresa, can you explain to the public the four different categories like we did at the board? I actually, could could I perhaps ask the panel to, to explain yeah. that? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I am really good at it. I've been doing this a while now, but I'd much rather ask yeah. someone whose job this is. Okay. 
I believe you're talking about the feasibility studies. Am I correct? Are you talking about yeah, no. yes, yes? So we're not there yet. No. Right now, yeah. we're just. Uh, but just to explain the categories, what it means for leave it at is, is revitalization, modernization, and certainly. All right. So there is five options do nothing, which the name applies, patch and paint, which consists of cosmetic enhancements to all existing finishes no overall systemic updates and will be made uh, will be made to the existing structure electrical mechanical and plumbing systems including cup code upgrades revitalization proposes building a series of targeted additions and interior modifications to provide all program space required by the educational specifications within a target of 10 percent of their respective area requirements the revitalization approach will meet the state requirements by updating the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, telecommunications, IT, and security systems. This also includes a thorough overall of all existing interior finishes, such as paint, ceilings, tile, and flooring, while still retaining terrazzo and um, block walls. The building and site will comply with all current life safety, building codes, and accessibility requirements. Additionally, this option will pro provide an um, enhancement both aesthetic and functional to the exterior envelope of the building, including roofing, masonry repair, and door and window replacement. Site design will make improvements to traffic circulation patterns, parking capacity, stormwater management, and requirements for play areas and athletic fields. Modernization will do all the same things, except for it will um, provide program spaces to the size exactly and adjacency requirements of the educational specs. The same will go for the interior partitions will be demolished as necessary to achieve this. Um, this option also includes life safety and building code compliance and overhaul of existing interior finishes. Site design would make the same traffic improvements. And then replacement is our prototype design. All right, we have Mrs. Nally. Oh, wait. I'm, I'm aware of this, but I want to, I'm asking this question uh, probably, well, of all of you. What it, because there, I've read all the, all the letters and uh, the emails. Um, that's how I spent yesterday, by the way. And some people think we don't read those, but we do read them all. We can't answer every single one. But the difference between the MGT and the and, and feasibility when you do I mean I know because I've been at this as Teresa said a long time I also was involved in the building of a school you know before so I know the difference but there's a great difference in when the MGT guidelines it's like looking from down it's just kind of an overall and when a feasibility study goes in I mean when I first learned about them I was so impressed with the details that go in could that be, be kind of explained for the public because a lot of people are under the impression that the MGT study is just like the be-all end-all and could, could we defer that to the feasibility studies because right now we're just looking at the design of George Cromwell okay which is a revitalization correct okay so Mrs. Summer do you have a question about George Cromwell okay Okay. We'll reset. <laughs> All right. We'll reset. <laughs> Dr. Aletto has recommended approval of the design for George Cromwell. Okay. All right. Uh, before you is the design development documents for the revitalization of George Cromwell Elementary School. The design development documents are the next phase in the design process following the educational specifications, feasibility study, and schematic design. These document, documents finalize the location, adjacency of all program spaces and circulation within the building. They also indicate all site amenities, including traffic patterns, parking, bus loop, playground, and play fields. Along with the design committee, curriculum instructors or directors had an opportunity to review and comment on the layouts provided by the design team. These discussions determine teaching walls, furniture layout, and casework within classrooms, media, and specialty areas. Anne Arundel County Public Schools Transportation Specialists, specialists evaluate traffic patterns for safety and efficiency. 
Maintenance staff ensures that our standards for mechanical, electrical, and general maintenance are included in the documents. And now I will turn it over to Jeff from Ford Copeland Mock to walk you through the plans. Good morning. I'm Jeff Hagan with Ford Copeland Mock Architects. And um, I'll walk you through, if we could get to, it's page 44 of the report, which is the existing site plan. There's oh, we I guess it's just next page. There you go. Thank you. Just to orient everybody, uh, George Cromwell is located between Wellham Avenue and Olin Drive with access to the site off of Wellham Avenue currently, and the front entry to the building faces uh, Wellham Avenue. Uh, we have a bus loop in the front of the building and parking in the front and off to the side with play areas, uh, play fields in the back. If you go to the next image please you're viewing the proposed site plan and the existing building as we mentioned is a revitalization so that will remain and the addition will then close the loop of the current building uh, creating a, a courtyard in the center of the building I mentioned to you that the current access is off of Wellham with the revitalization we're going to change the access to the site to come off of Olin Drive and that will allow us to have a separate um, parent drop-off loop and a separate bus loop and gives us a little bit of breathing room for the, for the traffic um, on and off the site. This will also allow us to move the front entry to, of the building to the uh, south side off of Olin Drive near these bus, bus and parent drop-offs. Um, and that will be built first. So we'll build the, the addition first to close the loop and move the front entry to the building and get some of the major bo big box spaces such as the cafeteria and gym open first. And that allows us to go back and, and take those other spaces offline. Students will never be without them during the process this way. And then we'll uh, convert those to other spaces, which I'll show you in the plan in a moment. Um, and then play fields will be recreated essentially where they are now. And if you go to the next, next image, please. This is the existing floor plan. Uh, again, the, the entry to the building is, is to the uh, left of the page, um, kind of the northwest side. And we have two rows of uh, two bars of classrooms connected in the middle by the media center. And then at the top of the page is the existing multi-purpose room, which is um, also served with a kitchen to the north. And next image. And this is the proposed floor plan, which really has not changed since schematic design other than we've just been um, further developing it. But again, the, the new entry now is relocated to the, to the uh, south side of the building with administration um, overseeing that front entry, uh, secure vestibule, and the before and after care all grouped together. Uh, as you move up the plan, the uh, uh, gymnasium and cafeteria are to your right, and those are uh, connected with a dividing wall. And then beyond those are the music classrooms, so they're near the new platform. And as you move around the plan to your left, uh, these are you're now moving into the existing building where we're going to revitalize those uh, existing classrooms. At the upper left corner of the plan is the existing multi-purpose room that will be converted to the new media center. And then as you come down the plan, the, we have an art room that will now face out into the new court courtyard and be allowed to have a nice outdoor learning space there. That is the former media center. And then as you come down the plan, we're going to have four kindergarten classrooms clustered together in that, in that left corner there. So they'll have their own little suite arrangement with a play, play area right outside of their, their classrooms. And then as you turn back to your right, coming down the plan, we just have some additional classrooms. And then that brings you back to the main admin suite and the uh, nurse's suite. Okay. And then uh, I don't, next, do we have... And then we have just some uh, exterior schematic images, uh, design development images, I should say. With This is looking at the front entry of the building um, with a new, the new main entry with a canopy for uh, weather protection as you enter the building. And to the right there is the before and after care. And then behind it is the new gymnasium um, uh, with pitched roof. And then next. This is actually the, the side of the building facing the play fields. So your gymnasium will have direct access out uh, onto the play fields. And the kitchen is wrapping it on the right corner there. The left corner you're looking at is the before and after care. We're also allowed to, allows us to bring natural light into the gym through that clear story window at the, at where the two uh, pitched <coughs> roofs are offset. 
And then lastly, this is actually just the back of the building where the service service area is, and then it starts to work its way back to the music classrooms and then connects back to the existing building. And the materials are going to be masonry and, and metal panels, and the intent is to blend it with the existing building so that it looks like one, one building. Okay. And I believe that's all we have. All right, Mrs. Birch. Um, two questions. Um, the first is, um, on page 44, it shows a Parks and Rec site building at the um, bottom edge of the property on off Olin Drive. Um, so I take it that's not our building, right? It's it's a county building. Now, is that going to have to be removed then? Yes. And, and what's going to are, are they are we allowing them space in our building it's for their a storage facility? We're okay. still discussing when they really need that facility. Okay. Okay. Um, it, I take it's a pretty small building kind of like a shed maybe I don't know maybe okay. a large shed okay a large shed okay um, and my other question is um, so for the class the existing classrooms that are being revitalized um, what can you explain to me what exactly is going to happen to those classrooms sure let me take that they they, they will be will say gutted in all new mechanical systems lighting systems uh, finishes will be um, I also had, have been kind of corresponding with the folks in the 55 plus community in Crofton <laughs> Colony and they indicated, um, the gentleman that I was talking to indicated that they have not surveyed the community as to whether or not they want the path removed. Uh, I, so I'm a little bit concerned that there's residents who are using the path for walking and exercise that are now going to be cut off from it just because a couple of people are advocating to have it removed. So I want to make sure that we I will double check check the whole community. And we not have just talked to we've had one representative that has represented the colony as a whole. Okay. And that's who I've been communicating the most with. There was the most recent email that we received as well that basically asked the same question. Okay. Uh, yeah. About I removing it. So, don't want to rip but, off. But I will follow. Up, I will path. follow up and make sure that they've got the full communities. Uh, yeah, it sounded like they hadn't yet done a survey. All right. Any other questions from the board? Uh, any public comment? All right. All those in favor? Design passes nine zero zero. Thank you. Item 4.07 is the Edgewater Elementary, Elementary School Feasibility Study. This is also an information to action item. Do I have a motion to move this from information to action? Second. All those in favor? All right, we now have an action item. And Dr. Rolato is down on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Your recommendation, please. Yes, ma'am, I apologize. Uh, I recommend approval of option C, revitalization. Second. All right, we're ready for the presentation. Good morning, for the record, Alex Chaknovich, Chief Operating Officer. Lisa Seaman Crawford, Director of Facilities. Kieran Wellness, Director of Architects. And so we're here to present item uh, 4.07. It's an information action item regarding the feasibility study of the Edgewater Elementary School. Uh, I will uh, sort of disclose at the front that uh, I plan to make some more overarching uh, orientation and comments at the beginning because talking about the process of a feasibility study, et cetera, are going to be applicable in all three cases. So if you'll indulge us, we'll spend a little bit more time on that process orientation piece on the first one. And then I think that will aid uh, the board moving through the remaining two items. So as I said, um, we're here this morning to review the feasibility study for Edgewater Elementary School. We undertake a feasibility study anytime that we're taking a look at uh, a comprehensive renovation or replacement of a school. It is a requirement uh, of the IEC, the Interagency Committee for uh, construction anytime that you're contemplating a uh, school replacement project or a comprehensive effort. It is widely held that a feasibility study is uh, critical and it's prudent that it be undertaken because at the outset it really is going to set the course of the entire project. So doing a, a deep dive review of a project at the beginning to take a look at its viability for 
a renovation or a replacement, taking a look at uh, site orientation, et cetera, is critical because, again, like I said, that will be a guiding, uh, guiding force. I will say that it's been uh, said many times uh, by different officials at the state, having been in this business quite some time, that Anne Arundel County is always held out. Uh, as an example of the way that a feasibility study really needs to be done, the quality of the feasibility study. And um, we've been asked many times to provide not just contacts for our uh, various design consultant partners, but actually the exhibits that we've uh, developed so that other jurisdictions can use these as well. But as I said, this uh, process essentially takes a look at five different options, uh, going from a baseline case of essentially doing nothing uh, to a patch and paint, which is a cosmetic uh, renovation type activity, uh, to a revitalization, to a modernization, to finally a replacement. Uh, we'll go through each and every one of those scenarios so that the board clearly articulate what the differences are between those. And I'll loop back to that in a second. But essentially, the board at uh, a later phase this morning will be asked to pick one of those five options that essentially will be provide direction to uh, the superintendent staff to where this project's to head. So let me talk about calendar a little bit before I get into the specifics. So the next phase of the process, once we're done here, will be to remit the uh, feasibility study and a recommendation to the public school construction program and members of the IEC and their designees. Um, it is a requirement that they review our findings, the entire report, remember that they've had a representatives that's been part of the review committee uh, all along the way, so they're cognizant of the entire process from start to finish. They'll receive the finished report along with this uh, board's recommendation, and they will undertake an independent analysis of not only the report in its totality, but the final recommendation of the board. It's critical that they do that because they play a fundamental role in establishing whether a project will or will not be uh, eligible to go forward. If you remember back to our work session that we held in this very room back in October, the very first stage of any process in the state involvement level is what's called the local planning authority. And that is an assessment of the viability of the project and whether it comports with the requirements, the basic eligibility requirements of even being approved for any funding at all. So the state will review the feasibility studies review your recommendation and determine whether or not to grant the individual project what's called local planning or LP for short. If it in fact is granted LP authority, that is an indication that the state will to some extent participate in the funding of the project to some extent. If they do not believe that it is a viable project and they do not uh, agree with the recommendation of the uh, local board, then they cannot grant the local planning authority, not grant the LP. If LP is not granted, the state will not participate in funding at all. There will be zero dollars, zero cents coming from the state. Now going up the graduated scale, uh, they'll take a look at the various renovation options and they'll take a look at the replacement options. Taking a look at the renovation options, and we'll go to, to them in more detail, the revitalization or the modernization, they'll weigh whether in their independent determination whether the building is a candidate for either revitalization or modernization. And furthermore, if the recommendation is uh, a replacement school, they'll take a look about at independently using their subject matter experts and their background through the Department of Planning, the Department of General Services, the Maryland State Department of Education, whether they in fact believe that the school is a candidate for replacement. I will tell you that uh, philosophically across the state, the state has been uh, very resolute in the fact that they have a hierarchy in terms of how they analyze projects. Replacement schools are the last option, so it's a high hurdle uh, to cross. The state of Maryland does follow a smart growth uh, strategy and the state of Maryland also uh, follows a tremendous amount of environmental regulations and anytime you have the opportunity to renovate a space instead of having to tear it down, send it to the landfill and build a space anew, 
certainly the further you move away from both the state's smart growth philosophy as well as their environmental concerns. If a building is eligible for renovation, uh, either to modernization or revitalization, the state then will calculate what the level of funding participation will be for that project and it will go through the budgetary process and ultimately um, pending availability of funds will be approved for that level of funding. They'll do the similar analysis for a replacement school should that be the decision of the Board of Education and they'll go through a calculation methodology to arrive at what their participation level would be for a replacement school on a funding basis. There is a potential, as I said earlier, there is another potential for a disconnect. So earlier I said that if they don't grant LP, local planning, there will be no funding forthcoming. The second differentiator then comes on that decision about whether a building is going to be replaced or renovated. If a local board decides to elect to do a more uh, expensive option, for example, replacement, and the state uh, IAC, again, those three uh, entities, the Department of Planning, Department of General Services, and Maryland State Department of Education collectively decide that a building can be renovated, they will provide only the level of funding that's commensurate with a renovation, leaving the balance, any excess balance, to be picked up by the local unit of county government, in this case, San Arundel County government. Um, so it's important to understand that the state will play We'll be viewing this through two lenses. The viability piece, is it eligible or not eligible to start with? And then secondarily, they'll be taking a look at it from a funding perspective about to which degree of funding would they uh, participate. Again, zero, the renovation level of funding, or the replacement. So let me back up then and go through the, the options. Uh, the do nothing option is essentially taking a look at the existing building as it sits today, and that forms a baseline. We're not spending any dollars on it. We're not making any changes to it. The building is essentially going to sit there the way it is, and then that's going to be the baseline against which everything is going to be uh, replaced um, or renovated. The next one, as Ms. Lisa Seaman Crawford mentioned earlier, is the uh, patch and paint that's simply a cosmetic enhancement to the building. So things like uh, paint, things like floor tiles, things like ceiling tiles. Uh, will be replaced so the building in appearance wise will look better but there will be uh, no systemic or component level, level replacements so the items such as the HVAC system, the electrical system, the roofing system, etc. they will all remain. There will be no additions done onto the building. There will be no code upgrades uh, done to the building. So essentially it's a very cursory cosmetic uh, enhancement to the building but does not in fact provide really any educational or infrastructure improvements. The next level up from that is revitalization. Revitalization is essentially, as Ms. Crawford said earlier, peeling the building back to its existing uh, structure. So any elements of the building that can be rehabbed, rehabilitated, and reused will be, and those parts of the building essentially come down to the concrete floor and the foundation that the building sits on, the masonry walls uh, that are potential for reuse, and the steel elements of the building. Under a revitalization scenario, additions will be put onto the building, spaces will be reconfigured, all, all of the uh, building elements, inclusive of electrical technology, life safety, the uh, public address system, the windows, the doors, all those interior finishes that we talked about, all of those completely get removed. And again, you're pretty much left with just a concrete floor, just the brick or block walls, and just some parts of the steel that can be reused. It is truly peeling back the building just to those couple elements and starting from new going forward. Modernization is actually the same thing with one caveat, and I will give you a concrete example so that you very clearly understand the difference. Modernization is exactly the same thing with one exception. And that exception is this. The Board of Education has what it's called an educational specification. It in words and in tabular format essentially outlines the program for a building 
tells you how many units of each type of space you need. So do you need three third grade rooms? Do you need four, four third grade rooms, et cetera? And it tells you how many square feet and what accoutrements that space has. The difference between renovation, uh, revitalization and modernization comes down to that square footage piece. So as we go through the table, the EdSpec table that was previously appro approved and the board took that action on May the 4th, if any space is within 10% or less of what the ed spec requires, that space is allowed to remain as is. The size and geometry of that space is essentially allowed to remain as is if it works. I mean, if it works within the overall program, et cetera. The modernization will prescriptively and mathematically make the square footage of that space be exactly what the ed spec required. So here's the concrete example that I use a lot of times with groups that I talk about. If, made up example, if a classroom is 30 square feet by 30 square feet, it's a 900 square foot classroom. And the ed spec called for a 900 square foot classroom in my example. If that room, if we go in and measure that room and a room is not 30 by 30, it is 30 by 29. You do the math for 30 by 29, it's only 870 square feet. In revitalization, that room will remain as is. The room will remain 30 feet by 29 feet. The room will remain 870 square feet in total and there will be a recognition that it will be 30 square feet short of the ideal in revitalization. In modernization, recognizing the room was short, 30 by 29, we will tear down that existing masonry wall, we will move it over 12 inches, and we will rebuild that same wall up again. So it prescriptively is exactly 900 square feet. That is typically the most salient example that I can give you. So revitalization recognizes that as long as you're 10% or less off, that we are not going to go through the expense of tearing down a wall, moving it over a couple inches, and putting it right back up. So that's the difference. Everything else is the same. Again, all of the electrical, the mechanical, the plumbing, the life safety, the technology, the phone, the roof, the interior finishes, the grounds, the play fields, all of those other components of the building don't change between modernization and, and revitalization. It really comes down to whether you're willing to take a look at the trade-offs, willing to take a look at those ed specs and say, if I am one, two, or nine percent off, am I willing to take the trade-off and accept that? Brand new is essentially what it is. So we're gonna demolish the existing building, we're gonna replace it, when the building gets replaced, it will also, just like with modernization, it will also prescriptively align with what your ed specs is. So if your ed spec said it was gonna be a 900 square foot room, that is exactly what you're going to get in a renovation. And it should be so, because we're starting out with a clean slate of paper and we can design um, what we wish. So let me walk you through just the executive summary, uh, which is in your packet. I'll ask your assistant to put that up. And we'll go through uh, this in a little bit of detail. And then I'm going to turn the presentation uh, over to my colleagues to go in much more depth about uh, how they undertake a feasibility study and the, the level of, uh, of inspection that they do. So you'll see on the exhibit before you an executive summary, option B, patch and paint, because again, option A was to do nothing, so we're not displaying that. The building is. 53,962 square feet. If we just do those cosmetic replacements, which is painting the building, replacing the ceiling tile, replacing the floor tile, and essentially touching essentially nothing else, we'll spend about $2.7 million on that effort. Life cycle cost, in all cases, in every case, the design team is tasked with delivering a product that can service and perform well for at least 40 years or longer, at least. So that's the benchmark. Each and every one will last 40 years or longer. 
So over the course of a 40 year period of time, if we do nothing other than the, the patch and paint that I described earlier, the life cycle cost, which is the cost to own that building, which is the utility cost, the cyclical maintenance cost, et cetera, plus the additional day one construction cost at 2.7 million, over a 40 year time span, the total cost of ownership of that building will be $9.6 million, and it'll take about 12 months for us to accomplish that level of effort, that work. The next item down, option C, revitalization, recognizes that again, we start off with a building that's 53,962 square feet. For this particular school at Edgewater, we will demolish 2,592 square feet of it. We will comprehensively renovate 51,370 square feet. Again, any of the spaces that programmatically don't work, any of the spaces that are more than 10% out of tolerance, and again, all of those components of the building are all going to get taken care of under revitalization. In addition to that comprehensive, deep level renovation of the 51,370 square feet, we are also going to construct 37,437 additional square feet, bringing the total building up to just under 89,000 square feet at an initial construction cost, so this is an estimate of what the contractors are going to be, uh, the total cost of the building day one when the bids are open of $25 million. Over a 40 year time span, the total cost of ownership of that building, which again is inclusive of that initial construction cost, will be $35,335,000 and it'll take us approximately 30 months to accomplish that. Under option D, modernization, you'll see that again, we'll start out with that initial 53,962 square foot building. We'll demolish 22,960 square feet in this case, leaving 31,002 square feet for that heavy in-depth uh, renovation activity. We'll construct 62,299 square feet new, bringing the building up to 93,000 square feet, just over. The day one bid estimate before the project is started from the different uh, contractors will be $35 million, and over the course of a 40-year lifespan, the total cost of ownership of that building, inclusive of the initial construction costs, will then be $45.3 million. And finally, the replacement. The replacement takes the entire original school, 53,942 square feet, tears it down, and replaces it with a brand new prototype building, which we have uh, constructed many times here in Anne Arundel County. Uh, for Edgewater, in this case, it will be 95,519 gross square feet. The initial construction estimate uh, at time of bid for those projects would be just under 35 million, 34.9 million. The total cost of ownership across the 40-year time span will be $40.8 million, and the duration for that activity will be $27 million, um, 27 months. So. Before I turn it over, let me address the question that Ms. Nally had initially asked with respect to MGT, if I may. So in undertaking a strategic facility utiliza utilization master plan, we're really, we're really at sort of the 30 to 60,000 square foot uh, view of the entire school district. Uh, it is undertaken by subject matter experts. There certainly are architects that are part of the team, as well as demographers, uh, educational experts, Ms. Nally, technology experts, et cetera. They're looking at, the, at all of our buildings from that viewpoint about, based on its age, based on uh, its capacity, et cetera, what in their estimation may likely be an outcome, a resolution for that building. They are not doing what is being done in the feasibility study. So I think that is a very important point. The feasibility study brings in a team of uh, subject matter experts, and I'm talking about on the facility side, of architects, structural engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, site civil engineers, uh, as well as constructors, uh, in the, uh, a construction management entity that has designed and built 
millions and millions of square feet and put millions and billions of dollars of construction in place. They are no longer looking at the building from a 30,000 uh, foot up view. They are inside of the building, going through the crawl space, up in the roof, looking down the chimney, looking above the ceilings, looking in all the mechanical spaces, et cetera. They're looking at the building not from 30,000 square feet away, Ms. Nally. They're looking at the building from inches away. It's a very different perspective. It's a very different level of scrutiny and expertise. Each one of those, tr those uh, three groups brings to the table a very different and unique lens. Architects are masters of space planning, of functionality, of adjacencies, of the aesthetics and the construct of the building, and the program, how the building is going to live and breathe and function uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to their technical competencies, that is really one of their lenses that they bring to any projects. Um, engineers are, are a different breed of people. <laughs> um, we don't much look at the, at the aesthetic side of things. Um, we were never good artists. We, we're, we're very different than architects. Engineers are really looking at that component level. So the structural engineer is looking at that beam, at that bar joist, et cetera, to take a look at whether that individual piece of the building, which individual pieces of the building have enough integrity to meet code compliance, to have a service life of at least 40 or more years. So they're looking at, at it at that inch away uh, level to take a look piece by piece, piece by piece, which one can be reused, which one has to be replaced. The constructors, finally, the, the construction management uh, entities, also have that component level detail. They've built, they've deconstructed, they've renovated, they've reconstructed buildings many, many, many times. So they are also looking at those individual components, saying, is this a piece of the building that I, in fact, as a constructor, can I reuse this wall? Can I reuse this beam? Can I reuse this foundation? And then to that, they bring one additional lens, and that is essentially the logistics element of it. So as a contractor, how, how in fact, can I reconstruct this building? Do I have enough storage space? Where am I going to bring my trucks in? Uh, what order do I have to take things down in order to put things back up? So these three different subject matter experts in a viability study are bringing their unique talents uh, to the table and looking at it in a very, very detailed way, Ms. Uh, Nally, that is so far more in-depth and analytical than what a strategic plan does, which is a much, much longer view um, of how the whole district works, not how an individual beam is going to work, not how an individual piece of pipe is going to work. Does that help maybe set apart those two? Is there a state representative there during this feasibility? Yes, so the uh, Maryland State uh, assigns a representative to all of the feasibility uh, studies that we do. And again, the state representative uh, participates, uh, certainly is, uh, reviews all of the documents. Uh, in this case, the state representative is also a, an architect, licensed to practice here in the state of Maryland. So she is very adept at knowing construction in general, school specifically, and what the state requirements are. The purpose of that, um, of that state representative is twofold. One, they have a statewide view. They see a lot of best practices, just like Grim and Parker, who does work not just all across Maryland, but across the whole region, and quite honestly, nationally, so does our uh, construction uh, management firm, for example. But they're bringing the statewide lens there's sort of a little bit of a check and balance. They help give best practices. Hey, I saw this on another job in Calvert County or in Garrett County. Have you thought about this? So they play a little bit of that, uh, that advisory role. But their critical role actually happens next. So when the project goes up to the state of Maryland, for them to review the Department of General Services, 
uh, Maryland Department of Planning and Maryland State Department of Education, that individual essentially reports to those bodies. They are the person that says, I was in those meetings, I reviewed the documents, I participated in the development of them, and based on this, I believe that, in fact, yes, we can successfully renovate this building. Or, no, that's not a viable option. The local jurisdiction uh, recommended replacement. And in fact, from my perspective at the state level, I am also concurring that that is, in fact, the only viable uh, option for this project. Remember I said earlier that the state sort of has a hierarchy of, of decision-making algorithm and the highest threshold of approvability, the highest bar you have to cross is replacement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the representatives of the state are, that are on all these feas feasibility study teams are reporting out to those three entities about what is their assessment of how the process went, give them an overview of the project, and then as a subject matter expert, again as an architect in this case, she is making an independent evaluation about can the building be su su successfully revitalized or modernized or <coughs> replaced, or is the building in such great condition that absolutely nothing should happen and therefore we should just patch and paint or maybe do nothing. Now students will remain in, under the revitalization. What safety, I've seen, I know that our county has done this over and over again. We have had um, numbers of schools that have been revitalized at the same time students are there. Some of the emails, there was a concern about student safety. Mm -hmm. And I know we have been extremely successful at doing this. So kind of explain, the, if you would, please, the process by which students remain in the building and uh, how careful we are, because I know that that has been a concern over the 10 years, was a concern, um, you know, and I think that's a, a valid concern to address. So over, over about the past half decade, Ms. Nally, about uh, two-thirds, a little bit more than two-thirds of the buildings that we've done have been uh, renovation projects, so that is our norm. Uh, more often than not, again, because of that sort of that threshold and affordability element of it, but uh, Two-thirds of our projects have been renovations. Many of those have been while occupied. Uh, we are not unlike many school districts. Uh, we essentially have limited options for relocating students in some cases. Um, so we look at each project very individually. Some projects can, in fact, be successfully uh, renovated while students remain there. I mean, certainly we're doing uh, Benfield Elementary School right now. We're doing Crofton Elementary School that we just recently completed, et cetera. In some cases, that's not the right fit. Some cases, we have to uh, move them off premises simply to accomplish the project. Student safety absolutely always comes first, Ms. Nally. There is not a single person on the school district staff. There's not a single design consultant that we work with. There is not the fire marshal's office, there's not the electrical inspector's office, et cetera, that would ever allow us to compromise the safety of the students. So part, a large part of the initial planning effort on any project really has to do with not just how do we execute it, but how do we execute it in a safe manner. So for example, we work with our consultants in the fire marshal's office and we create very detailed um, evacuation plans. You're familiar as a building principal, you had to do the, the monthly <laughs> fire drills. So we will construct an ev a design in collaboration with the fire marshal's office and again the architect and our own staff, a evacuation plan that's going to be applicable to each and every phase of the project. So for example at a Crofton or at a Benfield Elementary School that, that are near or just successfully went through this, we made evacuation plans for, that were applicable to each phase of their 30 months worth of construction that's conveyed to the school. The school drills those evacuation plans, et cetera. A lot of uh, barriers and precautions are put in place to separate out the occupied to non-occupied elements. You know that our projects are heavily regulated, so we have a lot of inspectors on our job sites at all time. We have a requirement of our construction manager that they have a safety professional that's part of their team. 
and creates a safety plan that's not just generates, uh, is not just looking at the safety of our students and faculty, but their safety plan is much more comprehensive. It's also looking at the safety of the workers, of the constructors, of the storage methodologies, <laughs> of where combustibles are held or not held and how far away from the building. So a tremendous amount of attention and detail goes into ensuring the safety of all of the occupants of that project, all of the contractors that participate in the projects, and all of the community members that may want to access that property while the project is going on. So it goes as far out as control, creating fencing plans, creating access plans, having uh, flaggers where necessary to move traffic in and out, and how does that work with our buses? How does that work with our cars? Hours and hours are spent working out those details, and those details are worked out with the school's administration fully involved in all of those because ultimately they're the ones that know their building, that know their um, student body, that know their community as well. So we need that local lens on those safety plans. Thank you so much. Alex, I have a question. With that state representative that is present during the feasibility study, mm -hmm. does he, she make a recommendation since we are looking also at the viability of the funding on any of these? No, ma'am, just, uh, so we have a community-based feasibility study, so the, the community representatives mm -hmm. uh, essentially are making that assessment. Okay. Uh, the state representative does not vote, does not recommendation. I mean, they're essentially, an, at that stage, they're an impartial observer okay. uh, of the process. They certainly participate. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, if, if there's a better way of doing things, um, th okay. they participate heavily because, again, they're in this business, they do it statewide. You know, they provide options, they provide opinions, but they don't vote on the outcome. They don't have a say to that extent. That's that's that community level. That state representative's recommendation where uh, he or she, she in this case, where her actual weight of her office comes in, that will come in at a later stage when the IEC is, re once they've received your recommendation, okay. when the state will independently analyze your project and your recommendation, it's at that stage that that state representative is working with her three entities to inform them on the process. Thank you. Mr. Granin. Thank you, Mr. Shaknovich, for that very informative presentation. What are the various uh, student capacity implications for each of the options? Sure, we'll, we'll go through each one of those individuals. So when the Board of Education created the ed spec at the beginning, and I did speak to um, uh, the different components of the building, the Board of Education also uh, adopted a state-rated capacity for each one of those projects. They're unique to all three, and we'll cover those. Um, but in each and every case, we are going to be able to support the number of students that, are, that were required when this board approved that state-rated capacity for the project. So in, in, no, in none of the options and in none of the three schools, is the capacity of the school going to be lower than what you deemed was appropriate day one when you approved the educational specifications? But there could be different capacities uh, implicated by each of these different no, options? No, sir. No, no sir. They're it's all the exactly, same. That's, that's my point. Okay. So under, under, all, under C, D, and E, C, D, and E will all support the exact same student capacity. Thank you. Yeah. Do nothing. We're short. Patch and paint, we're short. Most of these schools have portables, don't have enough space in them. Um, but C, D, and E all take you to the exact same number of students that you can handle in terms of the uh, prescriptive state rated capacity. That was my question. Thank you. Mr. Gilliland. Thank you, Madam President. I just have a, a broader question, and I know we'll get to some specifics. Yes, and that, that was my intent is, is, is to address any overarching issues before we look at specificity on each one of the three individual projects. And I may have some questions specific to Edgewater in, sure. in a moment, but um, you referenced Benfield Elementary, Crofton Elementary, and I know there have been others, revitalizations, modernizations, et cetera, you know, Northeast. Northeast, you know, another. And I know it's very hard to predict um, what could happen once you start uh, de uh, deconstruction, et cetera, but, um, or demolition, I should say. Have you seen instances when we've done these, I'll just lump them together and say renovations, uh, at, at any of those schools where um, 
you know, we, I, I, and I just look at, um, you know, what we have as, as the pros and cons or the advantages and disadvantages in each of the areas. And, um, you know, one of them just says potential for unforeseen, circum uh, unforeseen conditions in which uh, construction costs could increase. Right. Have there been surprises that, that you've discovered um, at, at any of the other schools? The answer is yes, but minimal. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example. We do not, at the feasibility phase, we do not what's called, we do not do what's called uh, destructive or forensic analysis, okay? So I'll give you a very concrete example. You have a, you have a brick wall, behind it you have a cinder block wall, and on top of it you have a window lintel. We're replacing the windows. We know that the frame, the window, the everything's going to come out. But based on everything we see, that we can see, everything seems to be intact. We, we at some point in time, are going to take that window out. When we take the window out, we find out that um, the insulation that we assumed was in place and still was in reusable condition possibly could have deteriorated we would then have to replace that portion of the insulation that has deteriorated. There would have been no way to tell that. We're not going to be drilling holes thousands of times in a building to peek at what's in that cavity between the brick and the uh, CMU block, the masonry block. Uh, so that is an un that, for example, is an unforeseen condition. We're working off of drawings that showed where the roof drain was coming down through a particular cavity in a wall. We want to put a doorway there. It's going to be a brand new door and a piece of wall that never existed, Mr. Dillon. Based on the drawings that we had on best available information, we said, oh, there's a roof drain coming right here. We're going to go about 18 inches away from that and we're going to put the new door right here. Well, we start chipping away the block and Whoever built that thing in 1963 or whatever had moved that pipe over 20 inches. And it was only when we started chipping away the block that we saw that roof drain pipe sitting there, not where it was drawn to be in the 60s, 18 inches to the left. It's right where our doorway is going to go. So we, those, are, those are very common unforeseen you know, conditions. There are on any renovation project, because we don't do that forensic level, we don't use bore scopes, we're not there with strain gauges testing every micron of the building. You know, there are many things that we are going to learn as we go later. What I can assure you is this there is a solid set of subject matter experts that are part of these. They're all licensed to practice here. They have years of experience on millions and millions of square foot of space, on millions and billions of dollars worth of construction. They do not enter into this uninformed. They're bringing their training, their experience, their background, their best professional judgment to the table. What I can assure you is this. After today, no matter what option the board picks, Mr. Gillen, no matter what option the state and the county ultimately elect to support financially. The next stage, as we just saw earlier with uh, uh, George Cromwell, for example, is we'll begin the schematic design, we'll begin to design developments, and we'll begin those construction documents. There will be yet more, by, I'm talking by headcount, there will be more subject matter experts that will inter intercede at that level. and. If we're looking at a piece of material a foot away right now, by the time we get to the SDs and the DDs and the CDs, we're going to be nose to nose with that piece. And the goal is to eliminate as many unknowns, identify as many conditions as possible to minimize those unforeseen conditions. There is no way we can guarantee that there won't be any. In fact, none of us have ever done a renovation project in our life that we've had not a single unforeseen condition, we, we know they happen. We take into account budgetarily that we're going to come across some unforeseen conditions in spite of our best efforts to try to identify them. And because we do account 
encounter them, we always know how to handle them. So we, as soon as we find them, we put our collective heads together and we quickly and professionally arrive at a cost-effective solution to that. Mrs. Birch. So one of my favorite things to talk about is money. And I want to talk about money collectively, about three projects. Um, obviously, we have three projects before us in the next three items that all had the same recommendation for revitalization and not replacement. And we have three community groups that would much rather have their schools be replaced. And and I like to look at numbers and money because that is always a factor too. And I understand, I mean, I understand that revitalization is is beautiful and I've been to revitalized schools and, and I would certainly encourage the folks from these schools to go see revitalized schools because I don't, personally, I don't think that they realize that it is a beautiful thing and that it's not substandard. Um, it is a fabulous thing for your school and it's not second rate. Um, but besides that, what I want to talk about, and I'm just I'm just using Edgewater as an example, and some things that concern me about something that you said earlier. If we ask for a replacement, and the state decides we didn't need a replacement, they would only fund at a revitalization level. No, they they can either decide to not fund you at all. Okay. Or they can fund you at the at a lower cost uh, renovation or, level, right. revitalization level, and whatever the gap is, so if they fund you at zero, the local county government would have, have to, to pick up 100%. If they fund you at a renovation level, revitalization level, um, the county government would not, to, would only, would have to pick up whatever it normally would have through that cost split, plus, plus the, the incremental difference, difference the increased cost difference so, to make up the state funding. So if I'm looking at, say, Edgewater, and generally speaking, even though we have a 50% share, the state share works out to be more like 25%. Yeah, about 23 uh, to 24% is what so we average. So I'm just going with 25%. Mm -hmm. Rounder numbers are just easier for yep. my off-the-cuff thing. So that's about six and a quarter million dollars. So that would leave 18.75 million of the revitalization for us to pay for on a good day, anyway, for the county to pay for. But if we did the replacement and they only approved a revitalization, the county would have to pick up 29 million of the $35 million project. Yes, ma'am. Almost 29 million. Okay, so that's a, that's a lot of money for the county to pick up if the state chose not to approve the replacement that we moved forward with. Now, we could always go back and say, okay, they didn't approve it, let's go back, but how long would that delay the project? Um, the earliest that the state would, uh, would uh, vote on the local planning of this, the earliest would uh, likely be in January, uh, would be the vote, we'd be notified in February. Uh, the latest in this cycle would be that they would vote on it in May and we would be notified late May or early June. Um, so if they re essentially, like a court would remand mm -hmm. something back to the local board for reconsideration, we are looking at best case uh, February before it would come back to the board. Worst case, it probably would be June at the earliest. Okay, so it is it is delaying the process right. if if we made that gamble right. and it's That's, also if the county would even pay the 29 million right and and unfortunately and, and unfortunately that's quarters. that's the delay on your side right the delay on the state <laughs> side is yeah, we would basically we would basically be knocked out of funding consideration For a this year. year so even okay. if the board would revote in june to take a different action the state wouldn't it wouldn't go back into the state cycle again until next october for a decision by the state uh, board okay. in now January of 18 or June of 18. So a delay like that could potentially cost a full year to a year and a half before the state would uh, reconsider again. Okay, okay, that does help me. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. The other thing I wanna talk about collectively about the three projects, um, because they are all here together on the same day. And so I do need to think about them all together on the same day. Um, when I added up the differences, 
between the revitalizations and the replacements for all three projects, it's $28 million, which is more than any one project, which is our next elementary school. And, you know, I know everyone thinks about their one project, you know, it's only 6 million, it's only 10 million, which I, I can't ever use the word only in front of any of those amounts of money. But, um, but when you add all of those together, that's next year's elementary school that needs to be funded, that would end up being pushed off by revitalizing schools, which again, Go to Crofton. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Fantastic. And I'm pretty sure Benfield's looking pretty good, too. Beautiful schools. Um, I, I think people have a, a misperception about what a revitalization is. Um, I think that um, we need to keep in mind what our limited resources in this tax averse county are. We don't have money to do new all the time. That's not what we have. And I think we need to be very conscious of our resources and, um, and just to be aware of that. I just want people to be thinking about that $28 million that's the difference between replacements and revitalizations. Thank you. Ms. Summer. The, the advisory team that meets and goes over the, fe the feasibility studies and makes their recommendations, they don't see any dollar amounts, do they? That's correct. They only are looking at yes. the building and the needs of the, the schools and ranking that, but they do not see any of the dollars. So the, they don't take that into consideration when making a recommendation. Yes, and the the, uh, the cost of the project uh, and the the design merges uh, when the superintendent reviews it to formulate his recommendation. Okay. Not Thank part you. of that. Mr. Gilliland. Sorry, one one more broader question, and it's just a follow up on on um, the exchange with Mrs. Burge. Um, and I just want to clarify something. It seemed like you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, if we deviate from what the state has preliminarily approved, what the superintendent is recommending today, and hypothetically we shift one of these or, or more than one from revitalization to replacement. We run the risk of having a delay of another year before we could replace the school. Did I hear that correctly? So one clarification the state has made no recommendations so the the state's not even other than being an observer of the process Exer they've okay. not been they've not made recommendations so this recommendation is that of the superintendent the board will vote on which of the five options they go the state has the next step is we will remit this as part of your capital budget we are asking for that lp status we're asking for the state in the FY18 request to provide that local planning validation that they will in fact agree that the project should be done and what flavor the project should be. They have a window, a, a calendar that that occurs in. If we elect an option that they elect not to support, they will remand it back to us at the local level for reconsideration. The board will then have to take another action or the board can elect not to. They can elect to work with county government and say, here's where we are. Are you willing to make up the, you know, 15 extra million dollars that we need on this project or whatever? So it, they'll remand it back down to the local level uh, for reconsideration. We, though, have to then respond back to them. The board will have to take another vote. It will go back to the state for their reconsideration now. <coughs> Depending on when that occurs, Mr. Gillen, their process concludes 
essentially just after the end of the General Assembly. So depending on how long it takes the state to evaluate it, whether they vote it in the June, February cycle, I'm sorry, January, February cycle, or whether they vote on it in that April, May cycle, if they vote on it in the April, May cycle, by the time they remand it back to you, their process is done. You could vote on it the very next day. They won't hear it again until it comes all the way back around until that following January, February cycle at the earliest. So unfortunately, the, the state has a very prescriptive calendar-driven process to, that they go through all public school construction projects in the whole state of Maryland. It's one calendar. All 24 of us have to abide by it. And we work really hard understanding the calendar or understanding by exactly what date we have to get something into Hopper to be considered for voting. Um, we try really hard to meet those milestones because we know if we don't, it's going to delay the project. And there is an adage that, that we live with in the construction world. And that adage is time is money. It is in general, Mr. Gillan. We live and breathe that phrase, time is money, because every month uh, of delay increases the costs of any construction project, not just schools, commercial, residential, institutional, you name it. Every time is absolutely money uh, in this. So we try to stay on that pace to get all those state approvals, to get all of our permits approved, to get things bid as expeditiously as possible because we want to get the contractors underway as soon as possible and not delay them another year or two, which will cost us additional money. Is that it? So, you don't ha so we don't have in the state of Maryland school boards that are say to the IAC, we'd really love a replacement, but we're okay with the revitalization. You guys pick. No, ma'am. It's a requirement that the local board um, vote their preference. The preference then goes to the state. The state then, independent of you, they're, they're taking into consideration, you know, this local board's perspective, but they are independent. There's three different state agencies that are independently evaluating your project, and they all have a vote. You have to have a majority of the IEC not only vote to support your project, but vote specifically on which variation, option A, B, C, D, or E. The IAC's recommendation then goes to the Board of Public Works, which is made up of the governor, the comptroller of the state of Maryland, and the Maryland State Treasurer. The Board of Public Works, the majority of the Board of Public Works, then takes an independent vote to either confirm or change the vote that the IAC took. So there's a couple moving pieces at the state level. So there will be two different votes at the state level that are both independent of each other. They, will, they know what your vote was. They in no way, shape, or form have to honor your vote. They're going to take an independent assessment of those projects and vote independently at the IEC level and then at the Board of Public Works level. And what's, what I've left unsaid, and maybe if I can, if you just indulge me 30 more seconds, and this goes back to Ms. Burge, and nowhere in this time frame have I brought in the county government. You're going to be remitting your budgets. Uh, uh, the superintendent will bring his recommendation to this board in December. You know by March 1, you have to bring your budget to the county executive. The county executive has until uh, May 1 to make his recommendation to the council, and the council has until June 15th to adopt their budget. Again, the county government is provided with all this information, too. They're not looking at it the same way as the IEC or the Board of Public Works is. They're not looking at it whether it should be, uh, you know, a modernization or a revitalization, et cetera. They're looking at it from a fundability, from a funding perspective, essentially. So if, a, if this board was to take, for example, a higher cost option and say the state agrees with you, hypothetically, this is pure hypothetical, Ms. Corblack, the state agrees with you, yes, we're going to do the higher cost option, your local county government could still say, thanks but no thanks, we're only going to fund it at the renovation level as well. 
So without the money, I can't do the project. I need, I need the maximum participation of the state, and I need the maximum participation from the county to have the project go forward. If either the state or the county is not on board, and remember, they are not obligated to fund you at the level you requested. The county government can fund you at any number from zero on up to the exact number that you asked for or any random number in between that they so deem fit. They are under no obligation to fund you at any number that's on the piece of paper in front of you. And if they don't, we're back here again. It's almost like being remanded, but now instead of being remanded for, uh, for validity reasons, which is more so the state's perspective, we're going to be back here yet again discussing where are we going to go with it because now we don't have enough money to do the execute the project. Okay, so now are you ready to go through Edgewater specifically? So I will now take a back seat and I will turn it over to my colleagues. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you all have the, the board summary booklet, which is kind of the, the abbreviated version of the full report that um, that we submitted earlier this month. I'm going to ask everyone to go to uh, option C. We'll start the comparison of the three options there. Um, if we can go to page 14 in the booklet. Terrific, thank you. Um, so the site plan on the left, um, just to orient you, this is the um, proposed site plan for option C revitalization. And the tan colored building uh, labeled Edgewater Elementary School represents the existing building as it stands today. And as Alex explained in his description of option C, that's by and large going to remain uh, the existing shell, the existing structure and bones, um, but all of that will be uh, revitalized uh, within. All of the orange uh, additions that you see there are the targeted additions to get us closer to, not 100 percent to, but very close to the EdSpec target um, within the, the program documents. Um, and again, to orient you on the site, Washington Road, the main access point is planned north on the top of your page. That's where the current access is from the upper left-hand corner. Uh, revitalization also gives us an opportunity to try to improve on the existing site circulation and site conditions. In this case, we are keeping the existing parking lot and drop-off loop, loop, which comes in from the west side of the site. There is a fairly significant grade change between the drop-off loop and the front door of the building, shown with that magenta arrow. That's going to have to be uh, reconciled with an accessible ramp. Currently, it's, it's not an accessible entry sequence. Um, the bus loop right now is, is quite small. That's going to need to be expanded to meet the prescriptive 10, 10 bus count that's in the ed spec. So that bus loop, again, is expanded over to the east side of the site. And then the um, ed spec also requires 115 parking spaces. We can only get uh, about uh, under a third of that in the existing lot to the west, so we've got to supplement that with more parking on the other side of the building. So what we're calling staff parking there uh, on the east side will give us the balance of that, that parking set so split between the, the two sides of the site. Uh, the building itself, again, a series of targeted additions to get us closer to ed spec. Um, we're going to zoom into the floor plans in a minute. The image to the right will show you in, in three dimensions. We do a quick blocking diagram with our um, computer software just to get a sense of massing and scale uh, relationship to the neighborhood. The dark blue in this case is the existing building, and then each of those light blue um, uh, modules is an addition that would get us closer to ed spec. Okay, we'll flip the page to the floor plans now. So page 16 is your uh, floor plan diagram. You're slightly um, oriented differently here. So Washington Street, which was at the top of your page before, is now on your left. Um, so that's going to get you your front door, your main entrance to the bottom of the page. You'll see the dark uh, dash line. That's the footprint of the existing building. So everything within that, again, is going to be revitalized. Everything outside of that is new construction by virtue of a new addition. Um, the main entrance is, is maintained, again, from that south uh, entrance point. Um, administration is expanded to meet program. Uh, the media center, which is shown on the, the left, kind of that darker blue color, is going to take over the volume of the existing cafeteria. Um, working our way around kind of clockwise, we're going to have a new addition um, straight up from that main entrance, which is going to be the early childhood program and associated outdoor play spaces. That's going to connect to, at the top of the page, uh, where that secondary red arrow is, that student entry point from the new bus drop-off. Um, that's going to connect a kind of a main street connecting all the public spaces before and after care, the gymnasium and cafeteria side by side. And you can see that cafeteria is within the dark red box. That's actually going to overtake what's now the current gymnasium. So that'll switch to the cafeteria and platform use within that same existing volume. Uh, working our way around, we've got a, some additions around the cafeteria to outfit the new, new kitchen, 
uh, properly right, right size that volume as well as the new mechanical electrical central plan for the building and new music rooms. Uh, the existing uh, classroom corridor that you see will be expanded uh, towards the, in this case, the, the south and, and east of the page uh, with additional classrooms to get us to that, count, that required count and additional, additional classroom addition to the bottom right. Uh, the learning labs shown in purple there are um, in the central courtyard area are going to take over what was the existing media center. So this will remain a, a one-story building in this scenario. Okay, and then we'll flip to page 20 if we could, and we're going to move to option D. So option D, again, you'll see the, the tan is actually what's, ex what's existing to remain. You'll see that tan color is, is a bit smaller in this case. With, the, with modernization, to hit those EdSpec targets, we need to do some more surgery on the building, so there will be more demolition in this case. So what's shown hatched within that dark red line is actually existing building to be demolished to make room for new program. And then again, the orange color is, is uh, a new series of, of additions here. What's the fundamental difference between this plan and the other is that instead of keeping that main entrance from the west at that lower parking lot, we're consolidating, we're trying to consolidate the main entrance into one access point at a new main entrance facing the street at Washington Road. Um, so cars and buses are now gonna come in together at that large red magenta arrow um, into one common entrance. So that entire parking lot is now gonna move to the east side of the site with a new access point from Washington Road. Buses will still enter from uh, the north uh, northwest corner of the site. And you can see that reflected in the uh, blue gel diagram with the massing as well. Flipping to page 22 into the floor plans, again, this remains a one-story building. Um, we talked about that new main entrance. Let's see, I think we want to go forward a couple of clicks to page 20. Back a little bit. Are we missing that one? One more forward. Let's see, actually page 22, right? Yes. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> Does everyone have that in their handout? Okay. Um, so we'll start with the, the main entrance again, coming in from that, uh, that red arrow in the, the upper left-hand corner of your, of your plan. Um, so here we reimagine and re reestablish the administration overlooking the comings and goings of that main entrance for security reasons, before and after care, the gym, the cafeteria, all along that, um, that northeastern Main Street sequence. Here we are rebuilding uh, the gym, and ca and, um, the, what was the old gym, into the new cafeteria and platform to, again, right-size that room and get us closer to target footprint and square footage capacity. Um, the classroom wings are again expanded, similar to, they were, to the way they were in the re revitalization. In this case, the media center is actually relocated to um, an internal room within the courtyard, and it's, th that's occurring so that it can be not only uh, close to the academic wings uh, for instructional use, but also closer to the front door of the building so it can be accessed for after hours use for the community. That was an important piece of feedback we got from the uh, uh, community committee. Um, early childhood in this case is in the former footprint of the um, existing cafeteria, and that's uh, to, the, to the bottom left of your page, your floor plan page. Okay, we'll go to the replacement option now. So site plan is going to get us to page 28. Okay, so we don't have a site plan. Okay. So in this case, does everyone have page 28 in their, their handout? Um, in this case, we're, we're demonstrating how the existing, the replacement building, we, we do have space on the site to um, logistically handle construction of that new, that new facility, which again, as, as Lisa and Alex mentioned, is based on the, the prototype uh, school. Um, so it's a two-story two -story structure. That's going to be built on when the current site of the fields on the western part of the property. Um, we're going to uh, completely reconfigure the, the parking to, to meet the EdSpec target of uh, 115 plus spaces and a, a bus loop for 10 buses. They're going to come into a, a combined entry to come in the Main Street entrance that faces Washington Road. Um, that construction can go on while the existing building is occupied. 
Uh, once construction is complete at approximately 18 to 20 months, that building would existing building would come down and then make room for the remainder of the fire lane, some of the play areas, and the multi-purpose field to the west of the site. We can go through the. Did we lose our signal? I'm on the, I'm on the full one now as opposed to the shortened version. So ah, okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Right, so this is the, the paired version where numbers are going to be off in your PDF. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this is the visual <laughs> description of what I just walked you through. Um, so you can see, so you can see how the, the site allows us to accomplish that phasing and logistics for uh, that construction sequence. And we'll briefly go through the replacement plan just to reorient everybody. Could we go one more, one more page forward? Thank you. So again, this is a two-story plan. Um, starting at the top, we've got our main entrance vestibule that'll be bringing in folks from overseas the main entrance for cars and buses. Uh, and visitors into a secure vestibule. Uh, our public spaces are aligned to the left of this page with before and after care, accessible again from the parking lot, the gym, the cafeteria, music rooms at the, at the south end. Uh, the two-story bar is on the right side of the page with uh, administration, media centrally located overlooking a courtyard, and then two uh, two-story classroom wings with uh, the K and pre-K on the ground floor with first grade and then grade clusters for grades two, three, four, and five in the north and south bars on the second floor. Okay. And that's a quick run through of options C, D, and E. And we're I think, happy to take questions at this point. Mrs. Birch. My question is actually about the original building and in options um, C and D, there's this one section of the classroom um, wing, the, the existing classroom wing that you tear down no matter what. I'm wondering what's wrong with this little section of the classroom wing. It's, it's a bit peculiar. It's actually, it's actually modular construction that was physically attached to the building as opposed to a freestanding portable. Okay. Um, so again, to meet the 40-year life cycle criteria, that really needs to come down to get it onto par with the rest of the existing building. Okay. I, I was just curious because it was going no matter what, and I yeah, was question. wondering what was wrong with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Summer? Um, one of the disadvantages that's listed says impacts underground domestic water tank maintaining service during construction presents a challenge what would that what exactly would that mean um, option C the revitalization it's actually re revitalization and modernization have that as a sure. Cur currently the building is on public sewer but we have our own well water there so we have our, a water treatment plant. We're on well water. We draw water up into a storage tank. It's treated and then put through the building. Several years ago, right across the street from our school is a nursing home. Uh, the national codes changed with respect to hospitals and nursing homes. They were required uh, to sprinkler their facility and put an emergency generator in. At that time, the Department of Public Works extended a water line that used to only run on Mayo Road extended a water line down to where the nursing home is that's now right across the street and there's a fire hydrant right there on Washington if you see it. So as part of the project, we're going to be coming off of uh, well water. We're going to be on public water supply on a public septic as well under all the scenarios. That's one of those logistics pieces that we talked about earlier. So when we get into the project deeper, we're going to have to identify where is the time and point when we can construct, create that connectivity to get us off of the well water supply and onto the public. Prior to that, we're going to have to maintain that well water supply that's, that's been in existence there. So that's part of that choreography and engineering that the mechanical engineers and the construction uh, experts are going to be looking at is how do we switch it over, but we're going to have to be acutely cognizant that we have to maintain that existing well water supply until we get 
to the switchover part. In the brand new version, we still have, in the replacement school, we're still on well water. We're gonna construct the building behind. We're still gonna extend that line from the public line that ends right in front of the nursing home, the rehab center, uh, over to the brand new building. So there won't be as much of a need to focus on the attention of exactly what do we construct in what order and what day do we switch over because they're going to be in total parallel instead of finding the opportune time. So it, it's, it's not a matter of complexity. It's really a matter of thinking through in a high level of detail the sequencing of the project and then working with the County Department of Public Works to to work with them about the line extensions, make sure we have the right permits in hand, et cetera. But it is, in both renovation options, it is something that we're gonna have to be, maintain a much higher level of, of cognizance about than we are in the, renov in the replacement. In the replacement, we're still getting off of well water. It's just, we don't have to be as concerned about that, switch, that data we switch things over. Mr. Gilliland. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and just going back to the um, advantages and disadvantages page uh, specific here uh, on revitalization, uh, there's a bullet point that says media difficult to separate for after hours use. And I know that that came up in some of the community dialogue early on. And, and thank you for referencing that as well. Um, that does not mean that the school cannot be used after hours, though, correct? Or that room or, or area? Correct. Yeah, no, in fact, we're purposely building the, uh, the gymnasium and the before and after care. It's being built to the, the same uh, level of standards and size and functionality as we have been doing in all of our projects. You, you probably well know, Mr. Galanda, we have a very long-standing relationship with the Reckon Parks operation, and they extensively utilize our building so um, in the after hours and in the weekend time frame. So, the the gym, in fact, at the elementary school level, this gym exceeds what our requirements are. They're actually being built to the Rec and Park standards that exceed our typical educational requirements for a um, gymnasium and the before the design of the before and after care room because that is run and managed and staffed by the Department of Recreation and Parks. It will be. Uh, they heavily lend towards the design of that. So it is fully being contemplated and configured to meet, again, our daytime needs as well as the community needs after hours and on weekends and holidays. Mrs. Summer. Under the revitalization, um, it says that two, there'll be, there'll be the two main entrances. Will both of those entrances, once, I know that those will be needed for morning drop off and afternoon things, during the rest of the day, would one of those entrances be locked and there would just be the main entrance that's used for the remainder of the day? And is, is am I understanding that Correct. correctly for logistics? That would be the intent. So it's, it's uh, positioned near the bus drop off. Mm -hmm. So for pick up and drop off, it would be utilized. And then the intent would be that that door would be locked the remainder of the school day and beyond so that everyone would need to funnel through the secure entrance at the main vestibule. Okay. Now on our, our buildings, Ms. Hummer, uh, just to elaborate a little bit further, nowadays we use uh, proximity locks because our faculty members have to take the class out for PE, et cetera. So there, in spite of the doors being locked, and they will be, there will be one designated public main entrance where we'll use our AI phones, where people will be screened through our Raptor system. There will be other doors in the building that will be locked, but a faculty member with the right credentialing badge, that lock will disengage temporarily to allow him or her and the class through, and then the uh, door will relock right behind them. One of the disadvantages under revitalization says there's no space available for future classrooms. Does that include learning cottages? Are we taking up all the space? Or if we needed to expand the school for any reason, can we still do it? As you've seen, we're, we're very creative in terms of where we put portable classrooms um, throughout the county. We work with the, you know, with the fire marshal's office to get the right separation distances, et cetera. But as you can see, you know, we are essentially you know, pushing the envelope out really close to where our property lines are or really close to where the road is or really close to where the stormwater management. So it would be difficult to add on additional permanent classrooms without 
uh, impacting things like the hard and soft play areas, et cetera. But portables are a lot more, you have a lot more flexibility with portable classrooms, learning cottages, than you do with permanent brick and mortar construction. I don't have any more board questions. I have 12 people signed up to speak, um, if you're still planning to speak individually. Emily Brandenburg, Reem Bahan, Joanne Clark, Bruce Bell, Lisa Van Buskirk, and Catherine McGuire are the first group. Hi. Um, for the record, I'm Emily Brandenburg. I'm the Education Officer for Anne Arundel County Government. It's much different being on this side of the dais. I've been in your shoes having to make the difficult decisions, balancing the wants, in the commu balancing the wants of the community with fiscal realities. The county administration supports the superintendent and the professional engineers, architectures, and construction experts who help formulate the recommendations. We will fund the three elementary schools, Edgewater Elementary School, Richard Henry Lee, and Tyler Heights Elementary School for revitalization. We do not anticipate providing any additional funding for replacement schools. We are working hard to make progress in our $2 billion backlog. $28 million is a significant amount of money. It's nearly another elementary school. Came in to um, mediate some growth on the walls in two of our, two of our classrooms. And he asked if the custodian had bleached and painted over these growths. And the uh, person said, yes, actually, this is the fourth time the growth has come back in these classrooms. And we want to save these walls for what? Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Arlotto and the Board of Education, members of the Board of Education. My name is Bruce Bell. I am a uh, community, community member in Edgewater. Um, I certainly appreciate the thoughtful uh, discussion this morning that you all have engaged in. I appreciate everything that you guys do on a daily, weekly, weekly and annual basis for the community and for the county. Um, I believe that the decision to revitalize as opposed to replace is ill-advised, and I implore you to make the right decision and to replace Edgewater Elementary School. Um, as I know you're aware, the management, the MGT study, as has been said by many people, was rec the, the MGT study recommended replacement, the school-based planning advisory com committee recommended replacement, and today, as you've seen from the results, the feasibility study even points towards that recommendation, not a revitalization. This, to the point uh, made by uh, Ms. Burge, and, and I certainly appreciate it, uh, this is really, if you look at, should look at it more as an investment in the community as opposed to the cost. We've just spent $96 million on a high school at Crofton, which will absolutely bring tremendous benefit to our county. If we simply look at this from a cost perspective and not an investment perspective, I believe we're looking at it the wrong way, let alone all the educational health security concerns. We need to be looking at growth, smart growth and development of our community, bringing in the right tax base to, consider, to, to continue to, to add to the tax base, to continue to make this one of the best counties in Maryland, one of the best counties in the United States. The problem with students being in the existing school during 30 months of construction will be a major educational distraction, let alone a major environmental and health, continuing health issue, which is well documented at, at this point, and the impetus for this entire discussion. This is not a question of just making our school look pretty, which I get the sense, you know, uh, revitalization is sort of, geared towards. We don't want a pretty school. We want a school that we know our children can go to and not be worried about health issues, not be worried about security issues. The, that is the reason we're here today. We're not looking for a pretty school. Of course, the aesthetics matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as all the other, mentioned, uh, the other reasons I've mentioned. The last thing I'll say about revitalization, by definition, revitalization does not meet modern standards. 
we heard from the uh, the subject matter experts this morning. It does not even meet the the standards set forth for forth for moderniz modernization. The difference in cost between what we're talking about and what is recommended as 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 you know for revitalization, yes, ten million dollars. But that $10 million can be more than well made up for with a, with a more motivated and increased tax base, which helps the county and helps our community overall. Again, I appreciate your thoughtful consideration, and I hope that you will vote for a rebuilt El Edgewater Elementary School. Thank you. Good morning, Lisa Van Busker from Edgewater. My children do not attend Edgewater Elementary, but I'm here in support of my colleagues. Uh, and community members. So they do not attend Edgewater Elementary, but three years ago, my son received some speech therapy services there. And I was surprised as a new community member to there that you could not drink the water there. And so uh, the report stated, strong consideration should be given to replacing the piping due to this lead soldier condition. Given the country's recent uh, experience with lead contaminated water in Flint, perhaps something more than strong consideration should be paid to the existing plumbing conditions in Edgewater Elementary among the many more health aspects uh, that the fellow families have to deal with on a daily basis. So, and I'm also concerned that the proposed, as my colleague mentioned, proposed revitalization does not meet your programmatic needs um, right now. So how can you make it a 40 year programmatic need decision if the revitalization doesn't meet what you want it to do? Uh, and we have no idea of the existing conditions of a building pushing 70 years by the time you start actually breaking down the walls and doing your forensic analysis, which will clearly add to the construction costs. A full replacement offers a healthier building, a safer building, an environmentally friendly building, a building that meets programmatic requirements, a building that can be constructed while existing one continues to operate on a quicker construction timetable than either the modernization or the revitalization. And it, it's actually cheaper than the modernization option. And really when you're looking at life cycle costs, yes, there's a $10 million difference between the revitalization. The state uh, board okay. in now January of 18 or June of 18. So a delay like that could potentially cost a full year to a year and a half before the state would uh, reconsider again. Okay, okay, that does help me. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. The other thing I wanna talk about collectively about the three projects, um, because they are all here together on the same day. And so I do need to think about them all together on the same day. Um, when I added up the differences between the revitalizations and the replacements for all three projects, it's $28 million, which is more than any one project, which is our next elementary school. And, you know, I know everyone thinks about their one project, you know, it's only six million, it's only 10 million, which I, I can't ever use the word only in front of any of those amounts of money. But, um, but when you add all of those together, that's next year's elementary school that needs to be funded, that would end up being pushed off by revitalizing schools, which again, Go to Crofton. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Fantastic. And I'm pretty sure Benfield's looking pretty good too. Beautiful schools. Um, I, I think people have a, a misperception about what a revitalization is. Um, I think that um, we need to keep in mind what our limited resources in this tax averse county are. We don't have money to do new all the time. That's not what we have. And I think we need to be very conscious of our resources and, um, and just to be aware of that. I just want people to be thinking about that $28 million that's the difference between replacements and revitalizations. Thank you. Ms. Summer. The, the advisory team that meets and goes over the, fe the feasibility studies and makes their recommendations, they don't see any dollar amounts, do they? That's correct. 
they only are looking at the building and the needs of the, the schools and ranking that, but they do not see any of the dollars so that they don't take that into consideration when making a recommendation. Yes, the, the, uh, the cost of the project uh, and the, the design merges uh, when the superintendent reviews it to formulate his recommendation. Okay. Not Thank part you. of that. Mr. Gilliland? Sorry, one, one more broader question, and it's just a follow up on, on um, the exchange with Mrs. Burge. Um, and I just want to clarify something. It seemed like you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, if we deviate from what the state has preliminarily approved, what the superintendent is recommending today, and hypothetically we shift one of these or, or more than one from revitalization to replacement, we run the risk of having a delay of another year before we could replace the school. Did I hear that correctly? So one clarification the state has made no recommendations so the the state's not even other than being an observer of the process Obser they've okay. not been they've not made recommendations so this recommendation is that of the superintendent the board will vote on which of the five options they go the state has the next step is we will remit this as part of your capital budget we are asking for that lp status we're asking for the state in the FY18 request to provide that local planning validation that they will in fact agree that the project should be done and what flavor the project should be. They have a window, a, a calendar that that occurs in. If we elect an option that they elect not to support, they will remand it back to us at the local level for reconsideration. The board will then have to take another action, or the board can elect not to. They can elect to work with county government and say, here's where we are. Are you willing to make up the you know, 15 extra million dollars that we need on this project or whatever? So it, they'll remand it back down to the local level uh, for reconsideration. We, though, have to then respond back to them. The board will have to take another vote. It will go back to the state for their reconsideration now. <laughs> Depending on when that occurs, Mr. Gillen, their process concludes essentially just after the end of the General Assembly. So depending on how long it takes the state to evaluate it, whether they vote it in the June, February cycle, I'm sorry, January, February cycle, or whether they vote on it in that April, May cycle, if they vote on it in the April, May cycle, by the time they remand it back to you, their process is done. You could vote on it the very next day. They won't hear it again until it comes all the way back around until that following January, February cycle at the earliest. So unfortunately, the, the state has a very prescriptive calendar-driven process to, that they go through all public school construction projects in the whole state of Maryland. It's one calendar. All 24 of us have to abide by it. And we work really hard understanding the calendar or understanding by exactly what date we have to get something in the hopper to be considered for voting. Um, we try really hard to meet those milestones because we know if we don't, it's going to delay the project. And there is an adage that, that we live with in the construction world, and that adage is time is money. It is in general, Mr. Gillan. We live and breathe that phrase, time is money, because every month uh, of delay increases the costs of any construction project not just schools, commercial, residential, institutional, you name it. Every time is absolutely money uh, in this. So we try to stay on that pace to get all those state approvals, to get all of our permits approved, to get things bid as expeditiously as possible, because we want to get the contractors underway as soon as possible and not delay them another year or two, which will cost us additional money. Is that it? 
So you don't have. So we don't have in the state of Maryland school boards that are say to the IAC, we'd really love a replacement, but we're okay with the revitalization. You guys pick. No, ma'am. It, it's a requirement that the local board um, vote their preference. The preference then goes to the state. The state then, independent of you, they're they're taking into consideration, you know, this local board's perspective, but they are independent. There's three different state agencies that are independently evaluating your project, and they all have a vote. You have to have a majority of the IEC not only vote to support your project, but vote specifically on which variation, option A, B, C, D, or E. The IEC's recommendation then goes to the Board of Public Works, which is made up of the Governor, the Comptroller of the State of Maryland, and the Maryland State Treasurer. The Board of Public Works, the majority of the Board of Public Works, then takes an independent vote to either confirm or change the vote that the IAC took. So there's a couple moving pieces at the state level. So there will be two different votes at the state level that are both independent of each other. They will they know what your vote was. They in no way, shape, or form have to honor your vote. They're going to take an independent assessment of those projects and vote independently at the IAC level and then at the Board of Public Works level. And what's, what I've left unsaid, and maybe if I can, if you just indulge me 30 more seconds, and this goes back to Ms. Burge, and nowhere in this time frame have I brought in the county government. You're going to be remitting your budgets. Uh, uh, the superintendent will bring his recommendation to this board in December. You know by March 1, you have to bring your budget to the county executive. The county executive has until uh, May 1 to make his recommendation to the council and the council has until June 15 to adopt their budget. Again, the county government is provided with all this information too. They're not looking at it the same way as the IEC or the Board of Public Works is. They're not looking at it whether it should be, uh, you know, a modernization or a revitalization, et cetera. They're looking at it from a fundability, from a funding perspective, essentially. So if, a, if this board was to take, for example, a higher cost option and say the state agrees with you, hypothetically, this is pure hypothetical, Ms. Corblack, the state agrees with you, yes, we're going to do the higher cost option, your local county government could still say, thanks but no thanks, we're only going to fund it at the renovation level as well. So without the money, I can't do the project. I need, I need the maximum participation of the state and I need the maximum participation from the county to have the project go forward. If either the state or the county is not on board, and remember, they are not obligated to fund you at the level you requested. The county government can fund you at any number from zero on up to the exact number that you asked for or any random number in between that they so deem fit. They are under no obligation to fund you at any number that's on the piece of paper in front of you. And if they don't, we're back here again. It's almost like being remanded, but now instead of being remanded for, uh, for validity reasons, which is more so the state's perspective, we're going to be back here yet again discussing where are we going to go with it because now we don't have enough money to do the execute the project. Okay, so now are you ready to go through Edgewater specifically? So I will now take a back seat and I will turn it over to my colleagues. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you all have the, the board summary booklet, which is kind of the, the abbreviated version of the full report that, um, that we submitted earlier this month. I'm going to ask everyone to go to uh, option C. We'll start the comparison of the three options there. Um, if we can go to page 14 in the booklet. Terrific, thank you. Um, so the site plan on the left, um, just to orient you, this is the um, proposed site plan for option C revitalization. And the tan colored building uh, labeled Edgewater Elementary School represents the existing building as it stands today. And as Alex explained in his description of option C, that's by and large going to remain uh, the existing shell, the existing structure and bones, um, but all of that will be uh, revitalized uh, within. All of the orange uh, additions that you see there are the targeted additions to get us closer to, not 100% to, but very close to the ed spec target. 
um, within the, the program documents. Um, and again, to orient you on the site, Washington Road, the main access point is plan north on the top of your page. That's where the current access is from the upper left-hand corner. Uh, revitalization also gives us an opportunity to try to improve on the existing site circulation and site conditions. In this case, we are keeping the existing parking lot and drop-off loop, loop, which comes in from the west side of the site. There is a fairly significant grade change between the drop-off loop and the front door of the building, shown with that magenta arrow. That's going to have to be uh, reconciled with an accessible ramp. Currently, it's, it's not an accessible entry sequence. Um, the bus loop right now is, is quite small. That's going to need to be expanded to meet the prescriptive 10, 10 bus count that's in the ed spec. So that bus loop, again, is expanded over to the east side of the site. And then the um, ed spec also requires 115 parking spaces. We can only get uh, about uh, under a third of that in the existing lot to the west, so we've got to supplement that with more parking on the other side of the building. So what we're calling staff parking there uh, on the east side will give us the balance of that, that parking, so that's split between the, the two sides of the site. Uh, the building itself, again, a series of targeted additions to get us closer to ed spec. Um, we're going to zoom into the floor plans in a minute. The image to the right will show you in, in three dimensions. We do a quick blocking diagram with our um, computer software just to get a sense of massing and scale uh, relationship to the neighborhood. The dark blue in this case is the existing building, and then each of those light blue um, uh, modules is an addition that would get us closer to ed spec. Okay, we'll flip the page to the floor plans now. So page 16 is your uh, floor plan diagram. You're slightly um, oriented differently here. So Washington Street, which was at the top of your page before, is now on your left. Um, so that's going to get you your front door, your main entrance to the bottom of the page. You'll see the dark uh, dash line. That's the footprint of the existing building. So everything within that, again, is going to be revitalized. Everything outside of that is new construction by virtue of a new addition. Um, the main entrance is, is maintained, again, from that south uh, entrance point. Um, administration is expanded to meet program. Uh, the media center, which is shown on the, the left, kind of that darker blue color, is going to take over the volume of the existing cafeteria. Um, working our way around kind of clockwise, we're going to have a new addition um, straight up from that main entrance, which is going to be the early childhood program and associated outdoor play spaces. That's going to connect to, at the top of the page, uh, where that secondary red arrow is, that student entry point from the new bus drop-off. Um, that's going to connect a kind of a main street connecting all the public spaces before and after care, the gymnasium and cafeteria side by side. And you can see that cafeteria is within the dark red box. That's actually going to overtake what's now the current gymnasium. So that'll switch to the cafeteria and platform use within that same existing volume. Uh, working our way around, we've got a, some additions around the cafeteria to outfit the new, new kitchen, uh, properly right, right size that volume as well as the new mechanical electrical central plant for the building and new music rooms. Uh, the existing uh, classroom corridor that you see will be expanded uh, towards the, in this case, the, the south and, and east of the page uh, with additional classrooms to get us to that, count, that required count and additional, additional classroom addition to the bottom right. Uh, the learning labs shown in purple there are in, in the central courtyard area are going to take over what was the existing media center. So this will remain a, a one-story building in this scenario. Okay, and then we'll flip to page 20 if we could, and we're going to move to option D. So option D, again, you'll see the, the tan is actually what's, ex, what's existing to remain. You'll see that tan color is, is a bit smaller in this case. With, the, with modernization to hit those ed spec targets, we need to do some more surgery on the building, so there will be more demolition in this case. So what's shown hatched within that dark red line is actually existing building to be demolished to make room for new program. And then again, the orange color is, is uh, a new series of, of additions here. What's the fundamental difference between this plan and the other is that instead of keeping that main entrance from the west at that lower parking lot, we're consolidating, we're trying to consolidate the main entrance into one access point at a new main entrance facing the street at Washington Road. Um, so cars and buses are now going to come in together at that large red magenta arrow um, into one common entrance. So that entire parking lot is now going to move to the east side of the site with a new access point from Washington Road. Buses will still enter from uh, the north uh, northwest corner of the site. And you can see that reflected in the uh, blue gel diagram with the massing as well. Flipping to page 22 into the floor plans, again, this remains a one-story building. Um, we talked about that new main entrance. Let's see. I think we want to go forward a couple of clicks to page 20. Back a little bit. Okay. 
Are we missing that one? <coughs> one more forward. Let's see, actually page 22, right? Yes. Well, that's too bad. <laughs> Does everyone have that in their handout? Okay. Um, so we'll start with the, the main entrance again coming in from that, uh, that red arrow in the, the upper left-hand corner of your, of your plan. Um, so here we reimagine and re reestablish the administration overlooking the comings and goings of that main entrance for security reasons, before and after care, the gym, the cafeteria, all along that, um, that northeastern Main Street sequence. Here we are rebuilding uh, the gym, and ca and, um, to what was the old gym, into the new cafeteria and platform to, again, right-size that room and get us closer to target footprint and square footage capacity. Um, the classroom wings are again expanded, similar to, they were, to the way they were in the re revitalization. In this case, the media center is actually relocated to um, an internal room within the courtyard, and it's, th that's occurring so that it can be not only uh, close to the academic wings uh, for instructional use, but also closer to the front door of the building so it can be accessed for after hours use for the community. That was an important piece of feedback we got from the uh, uh, community committee. Um, early childhood in this case is in the former footprint of the um, existing cafeteria, and that's uh, to, the, to the bottom left of your page, your floor plan page. Okay, we'll go to the replacement option now. So site plan is going to get us to page 28. Okay, so we don't have a site plan. Go back one. Okay. So in this case, does everyone have page 28 in their, their handout? Um, in this case, we're, we're demonstrating how the existing, the replacement building, we, we do have space on the site to um, logistically handle construction of that new, that new facility, which again, as, as Lisa and Alex mentioned, is based on the, the prototype uh, school. Um, so it's a two-story two -story structure. That's going to be built on when the current site of the fields on the western part of the property. Um, we're going to uh, completely reconfigure the, the parking to, to meet the EdSpec target of uh, 115 plus spaces and a, a bus loop for 10 buses. They're going to come into a, a combined entry to come in the Main Street entrance that faces Washington Road. Um, that construction can go on while the existing building is occupied. Uh, once construction is complete at approximately 18 to 20 months, that building would, existing building would come down and then make room for the remainder of the fire lane, some of the play areas, and the multipurpose field to the west of the site. We can go through the, did we lose our signal? I'm on the, I'm on the full one now as opposed to the shortened version. So ah, okay. Be those Great. Thank you. Okay. Right, so this is the, p the paired version where numbers are going to be off in your PDF. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this is the visual <laughs> description of what I just walked you through. Um, so you can see, so you can see how the, the site allows us to accomplish that phasing and logistics for uh, that construction sequence. And we'll briefly go through the replacement plan just to reorient everybody. Could we go one more one more page forward? Thank you. So again, this is a two-story plan. Um, starting at the top, we've got our main entrance vestibule that'll be bringing in folks from overseas the main entrance for cars and buses uh, and visitors into a secure vestibule. Uh, our public spaces are aligned to the left of this page with before and after care accessible again from the parking lot, the gym, the cafeteria, music rooms at the, at the south end. Uh, the two-story bar is on the right side of the page with uh, administration, media centrally located overlooking a courtyard, and then two uh, two-story classroom wings with uh, the K and pre-K on the ground floor with first grade and then grade clusters for grades two, three, four, and five in the north and south bars on the second floor. Okay. That's a quick run through of options C, D, and E. And we're happy to take questions at this point. Mrs. Birch? 
My question is actually about the original building and in options um, C and D, there's this one section of the classroom um, wing, the, the existing classroom wing that you tear down no matter what. I'm wondering what's wrong with this little section of the classroom wing. It's, it's a bit peculiar. It's actually, it's actually modular construction that was physically attached to the building as opposed to a freestanding portable. Okay. Um, so again, to meet the 40 year life cycle criteria, that really needs to come down to get it on to par with the rest of the existing building. Okay. I, I was just curious because it was going no matter what and I yeah, was question. wondering what was wrong with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Summer? Um, one of the disadvantages that's listed says impacts underground domestic water tank maintaining service during construction presents a challenge what would that what exactly would that mean um, option C the revitalization it's actually re revitalization and modernization have that as a sure. Cur currently the building is on public sewer but we have our own well water there so we have our, a water treatment plant we're on well water we draw water up into a storage tank, it's treated and then put through the building. Several years ago, right across the street from our school is a nursing home. Uh, the national codes changed with respect to hospitals and nursing homes. They were required uh, to sprinkler their facility and put an emergency generator in. At that time, the Department of Public Works extended a water line that used to only run on Mayo Road extended a water line down to where the nursing home is that's now right across the street and there's a fire hydrant right there on Washington if you see it so as part of the project we're going to be coming off of uh, well water we're going to be on public water supply on a public septic as well under all the scenarios that's one of those logistics pieces that we talked about earlier so when we get into the project deeper we're going to have to identify where is the time and point when we can construct, create that connectivity to get us off of the well water supply and onto the public. Prior to that, we're going to have to maintain that well water supply that's, that's been in existence there. So that's part of that choreography and engineering that the mechanical engineers and the construction uh, experts are going to be looking at is how do we switch it over, but we're going to have to be acutely cognizant that we have to maintain that existing well water supply until we get to the switchover part. In the brand new version, we still have, in the replacement school, we're still on well water. We're going to construct the building behind. We're still going to extend that line from the public line that ends right in front of the nursing home, the rehab center, uh, over to the brand new building. So there won't be as much of a need to focus on the attention of exactly what do we construct in what order and what day do we switch over because they're going to be in total parallel instead of finding the opportune time. So it's, it's not a matter of complexity. It's really a matter of thinking through in a high level of detail the sequencing of the project and then working with the County Department of Public Works to to work with them about the line extensions, make sure we have the right permits in hand, et cetera. But it is, in both renovation options, it is something that we're going to have to be, maintain a much higher level of, of cognizance about than we are in the, renov in the replacement. In the replacement, we're still getting off of well water. It's just we don't have to be as concerned about that, switch, that data we switch things over. Mr. Gilliland. Thank you, Madam President. Um, and just going back to the um, advantages and disadvantages page uh, specific here uh, on revitalization, uh, there's a bullet point that says media difficult to separate for after hours use. And I know that that came up in some of the community dialogue early on. And, and thank you for referencing that as well. Um, that does not mean that the school cannot be used after hours, though, correct? Or that room or, or area? Correct. Yeah, no, in fact, we're purposely building the, uh, the gymnasium and the before and after care. It's being built to the, the same uh, level of standards and size and functionality as we have been doing in all of our projects. You, you probably well know, Mr. Galanda, we have a very long-standing relationship with the Reckon Parks operation, and they extensively utilize our building. So um, 
in the after hours and in the weekend time frame. So the, the gym, in fact, at the elementary school level, this gym exceeds what our requirements are. They're actually being built to the Rec and Park standards that exceed our typical educational requirements for a um, gymnasium and the, before, the design of the before and after care room because that is run and managed and staffed by the Department of Recreation and Parks. It will be, uh, they heavily lend towards the design of that. So it is fully being contemplated and configured to meet, again, our daytime needs as well as the community needs after hours and on weekends and holidays. Mrs. Summer. Under the revitalization, um, it says that two, there'll be, there'll be the two main entrances. Will both of those once I know that those will be needed for morning drop off and afternoon things during the rest of the day would one of those entrances be locked and there would just be the main entrance that's used for the remainder of the day and is, is am I understanding that Correct. correctly for logistics that would be the intent so it's it's a position near the bus drop off mm -hmm. so for pick up and drop off it would be utilized and then the intent would be that that door would be locked the remainder of the school day and beyond so that everyone would need to funnel through the secure entrance at the main vestibule. Okay. Now on our, our buildings, Ms. Hummer, uh, just to elaborate a little bit further, nowadays we use uh, proximity locks because our faculty members have to take the class out for PE, et cetera. So there, in spite of the doors being locked, and they will be, there will be one designated public main entrance where we'll use our AI phones, where people will be screened through our Raptor system. There will be other doors in the building that will be locked but a faculty member with the right credentialing badge, that lock will disengage temporarily to allow him or her and the class through, and then the uh, door will relock right behind them. One of the disadvantages under revitalization says there's no space available for future classrooms. Does that include learning cottages? Are we taking up all the space, or if we needed to expand the school for any reason, can we still do it? As you've seen, we're we're very creative in terms of where we put portable classrooms um, throughout the county. We work with the you know with the fire marshal's office to get the right separation distances, et cetera. But as you can see, you know we are essentially you know pushing the envelope out really close to where our property lines are, or really close to where the road is, or really close to where the stormwater management. So it would be difficult to add on additional permanent classrooms without. Uh, impacting things like the hard and soft play areas, et cetera. But portables are a lot more, you have a lot more flexibility with portable classrooms, learning cottages, than you do with permanent brick and mortar construction. I don't have any more board questions. I have 12 people signed up to speak, um, if you're still planning to speak individually. Emily Brandenburg, Reem Bahan, Joanne Clark, Bruce Bell, Lisa Van Buskirk, and Catherine McGuire are the first group. Hi. Um, for the record, I'm Emily Brandenburg. I'm the Education Officer for Anne Arundel County Government. It's much different being on this side of the dais. I've been in your shoes having to make the difficult decisions, balancing the wants, in the commu balancing the wants of the community with fiscal realities. The county administration supports the superintendent and the professional engineers, architectures, and construction experts who help formulate the recommendations. We will fund the three elementary schools, Edgewater Elementary School, Richard Henry Lee, and Tyler Heights Elementary School for revitalization. We do not anticipate providing any additional funding for replacement schools. We are working hard to make progress in our $2 billion backlog. $28 million is a significant amount of money. It's nearly another elementary school. Came in to um, mediate some growth on the walls in two of, our two of our classrooms. And he asked if the custodian had bleached and painted over these growths. And the uh, person said, yes, actually, this is the fourth time the growth has come back in these classrooms. And we want to save these walls for what? Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Arlotto and the Board of Education, members of the Board of Education. My name is Bruce Bell. I'm a uh, community, community member in Edgewater. 
Um, I certainly appreciate the thoughtful uh, discussion this morning that you all have engaged in. I appreciate everything that you guys do on a daily, weekly, weekly and annual basis for the community and for the county. Um, I believe that the decision to revitalize as opposed to replace is ill-advised and I implore you to make the right decision and to replace Edgewater Elementary School. Um, as I know you're aware, the management, the MGT study, as has been said by many people, was rec the, the MGT study recommended replacement. The school-based planning advisory com committee recommended replacement. And today, as you've seen from the results, the feasibility study even points towards that recommendation, not a revitalization. This, to the point uh, made by uh, Ms. Burge, and, and I certainly appreciate it, uh, this is really, if you look at, should look at it more as an investment in the community as opposed to the cost. We've just spent $96 million on a high school at Crofton, which will absolutely bring tremendous benefit to our county. If we simply look at this from a cost perspective and not an investment perspective, I believe we're looking at it the wrong way, let alone all the educational health security concerns. We need to be looking at growth, smart growth and development of our community, bringing in the right tax base to, consider, to, to continue to, to add to the tax base, to continue to make this one of the best counties in Maryland, one of the best counties in the United States. The problem with students being in the existing school during 30 months of construction will be a major educational distraction let alone a major environmental and health continuing health issue, which is well documented at, at this point. And the impetus for this entire discussion, this is not a question of just making our school look pretty, which I get the sense, you know, uh, revitalization is sort of geared towards. We don't want a pretty school. We want a school that we know our children can go to and not be worried about health issues not be worried about security issues. The, that is the reason we're here today. We're not looking for a pretty school. Of course, the aesthetics matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as all the other, mentioned, uh, the other reasons I've mentioned. The last thing I'll say about revitalization, by definition, revitalization does not meet modern standards. We heard from the, uh, the subject matter experts this morning. It does not even meet the, the standards set forth for, forth for moderniz modernization. The difference in cost between what we're talking about and what is recommended as, as, as you know, for revitalization, yes, $10 million. But that $10 million can be more than well made up for with a, with a more motivated and increased tax base, which helps the county and helps our community overall. Again, I appreciate your thoughtful consideration and I hope that you will vote for a rebuilt El Edgewater Elementary School. Thank you. Good morning, Lisa Van Busker from Edgewater. My children do not attend Edgewater Elementary, but I'm here in support of my colleagues uh, and community members. So they do not attend Edgewater Elementary, but three years ago, my son received some speech therapy services there. And I was surprised as a new community member to there that you could not drink the water there. And so, uh, the report stated, strong consideration should be given to replacing the piping due to this lead soldier condition. Given the country's recent uh, experience with lead contaminated water in Flint, perhaps something more than strong consideration should be paid to the existing plumbing conditions in Edgewater Elementary. Among the many more health aspects uh, that the fellow families have to deal with on a daily basis. So, and I'm also concerned that the as my colleague mentioned, proposed revitalization does not meet your programmatic needs um, right now. So how can you make it a 40-year programmatic need decision if the revitalization doesn't meet what you want it to do? Uh, and we have no idea of the existing conditions of a building pushing 70 years by the time you start actually breaking down the walls and doing your forensic analysis, which will clearly add to the construction costs. A full replacement offers a healthier building a safer building, an environmentally friendly building, a building that meets programmatic requirements, a building that can be constructed while existing one continues to operate on a quicker construction timetable than either the modernization or the revitalization. And it 
it's actually cheaper than the modernization option. And really, when you're looking at life cycle costs, yes, there's a $10 million difference between the reallocation. Waited long enough and deserve a new and bigger Edgewater Elementary. And I have to add, I'm in the school a lot. And just a few weeks ago, somebody from the county came in to um, mediate some growth on the walls in two of our, two of our classrooms. And he asked if the custodian had bleached and painted over these growths. And the uh, person said, yes, actually, this is the fourth time the growth has come back in these classrooms. And we want to save these walls for what? Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Arlotto and the Board of Education, members of the Board of Education. My name is Bruce Bell. I am a uh, community, community member in Edgewater. Um, I certainly appreciate the thoughtful uh, discussion this morning that you all have engaged in. I appreciate everything that you guys do on a daily, week weekly, and annual basis for the community and for the county. Um, I believe that the decision to revitalize as opposed to replace is ill-advised, and I implore you to make the right decision and to replace Edgewater Elementary School. Uh, as I know you're aware, the management, the MGT study, as has been said by many people, was rec the, the MGT study recommended replacement, the school-based planning advisory com committee recommended replacement, and today, as you've seen from the results, the feasibility study even points towards that recommendation, not a revitalization. This, to the point uh, made by uh, Ms. Burge, and, and I certainly appreciate it, uh, this is really, if you look at, should look at it more as an investment in the community as opposed to the cost. We've just spent $96 million on a high school at Crofton, which will absolutely bring tremendous benefit to our county. If we simply look at this from a cost perspective and not an investment perspective, I believe we're looking at it the wrong way, let alone all the educational health security concerns. We need to be looking at growth, smart growth and development of our community, bringing in the right tax base to, consider, to, to continue to, to add to the tax base, to continue to make this one of the best counties in Maryland, one of the best counties in the United States. The problem with students being in the existing school during 30 months of construction will be a major educational distraction, let alone a major environmental and health continuing health issue, which is well documented at, at this point, and the impetus for this entire discussion. This is not a question of just making our school look pretty, which I get the sense, you know, uh, revitalization is sort of geared towards. We don't want a pretty school. We want a school that we know our children can go to and not be worried about health issues, not be worried about security issues. The, that is the reason we're here today. We're not looking for a pretty school. Of course, the aesthetics matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as all the other, mention, uh, the other reasons I've mentioned. The last thing I'll say about revitalization, by definition, revitalization does not meet modern standards. We heard from the, uh, the subject matter experts this morning. It does not even meet the, the standards set forth for, forth for modern, modernization. The difference in cost between what we're talking about and what is recommended as, as, as you know, for revitalization, yes, $10 million. But that $10 million can be more than well made up for with a, with a more motivated and increased tax base, which helps the county and helps our community overall. Again, I appreciate your thoughtful consideration, and I hope that you will vote for a rebuilt El Edgewater Elementary School. Thank you. Good morning, Lisa Van Buskirk from Edgewater. My children do not attend Edgewater Elementary, but I'm here in support of my colleagues. Uh, and community members. So they do not attend Edgewater Elementary, but three years ago, my son received some speech therapy services there. And I was surprised as a new community member to there that you could not drink the water there. And so uh, 
The report stated strong consideration should be given to replacing the piping due to this lead solder condition. Given the country's recent uh, experience with lead contaminated water in Flint, perhaps something more than strong consideration should be paid to the existing plumbing conditions in Edgewater Elementary. Among the many more health aspects uh, that the fellow families have to deal with on a daily basis. So, and I'm also concerned that the provost, as my colleague mentioned, the proposed revitalization does not meet your programmatic needs um, right now. So how can you make it a 40 year programmatic need decision if the revitalization doesn't meet what you want it to do? Uh, and we have no idea of the existing conditions of a building pushing 70 years by the time you start actually breaking down the walls and doing your forensic analysis, which will clearly add to the construction costs. A full replacement offers a healthier building, a safer building, an environmentally friendly building, a building that meets programmatic requirements, a building that can be constructed while the existing one continues to operate on a quicker construction timetable than either the modernization or the revitalization. And it, it's actually cheaper than the modernization option. And really when you're looking at life cycle costs, yes, there's a $10 million difference between the revitalization. Gosh. If you have great schools and you build a replacement school here, that'll be a great school, just like it is in Lothian, just like a lot of other new schools are. It will attract people and it will attract dollars to the county. I don't think it'll attract 40% more dollars. That's that's a tax rate issue, not a not well, a I, I, people I know you advocate for issue. more taxes. I don't, but I think there are other ways to raise I, money. I don't in the know county. how you get 40% more dollars for a school with more people coming. That. Well, that doesn't quite no. add up, um, but I just I just want you to to think about that and think about what you would do. And I'd love to see your take on the capital budget when it comes out and how you would move the money around. And would like for you to be public with your your views on that. Oh, I do. At, as you say, where the money should go. I'm running for office, so I'll be very public. Thank you, Mrs. Sasso. Did you have a question for John? Yes, I have a question, and this has to do with being a real estate broker. There's three issues that basically you have mentioned the community you know that basically concern me in construction and these issues I would go back to the board to the construction people to basically answer them to and one of them is the mold issue mold does not go away so yeah. I, I agree with that so I I would like to see basically in the studies that were done if there was any consideration taken as to where does that mold come from, especially after I was told that it's on well water and you cannot drink that well water. That is, lead-based paint is also a huge issue in the construction industry and for the real estate industry, which is basically what we are doing is construction. And the second one is basically security, which I think they touched upon it with the batches. So that one is, Come see, come saw, like they see in French. But the mold and the lead-based paint were not addressed in this <coughs> construction package that we were given. So I would say I would go back and basically ask, if we do revitalization, how are they taking that into consideration? We'll finish public comment on this, and we'll probably bring Alex back up. Okay. My turn. <laughs> Hi, I'm Connie Phelps. Uh, I've been an Edgewater resident for 14 years, and in that time, I've seen Edgewater have a lot of growth. Uh, Homeport Farms was developed. Uh, we've added the CVS, the Walgreens, the Chipotle, Panera. Um, all this growth has brought about a wonderful change in the community. New residents pay and businesses pay taxes and provide services. Uh, as an example, a resident of Homeport Farms has been running a Cub Scout troop, teaching boys about service and honor in the years since he moved here. Um, the existing Edgewater Elementary building has lasted for over 60 years with two additions and the use of portables. A lot of residents are angry about this, but part of me is impressed. I mean, the Edgewater taxpayers really got their money worth out of this investment 60 years ago. And why did they get their money's worth? Why was the building able to be serviceable for so long? Because it was adaptable to the changes in the community, because there were room for additions. The feasibility study states that the proposed renovation of Edgewater Elementary leaves no room for growth. What does that leave us with? A $25 million Band-Aid that's not going to be adaptable to the change and growth that have made this community such a great place to live? I plan to live here for another 40 years. If you want my vote, 
take the long-term view and build a school that will last, a school that spends the taxpayers' money wisely. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I currently live in Poplar Point. Uh, my wife and I moved here several years ago and I'm moving to Homeport Farms. Uh, I want to note that's located in Edgewater, not in Maryland. Or, uh, sorry, not in Annapolis, but we'll save that for the, uh, the meeting when we talk about redistricting. Um, I'm here, I, I want to just tell you really quickly a little bit about myself. We've already heard a lot of the facts about the school. I'm a proud product of the, of the uh, public, public elementary, middle school, and high school uh, system. My brothers and I all attended top uh, public universities and Ivy League uh, schools. My mother was a public teacher public school teacher. My mother-in-law has been a public school teacher for over 30 years. My grandfather was a superintendent of several school systems. I'm sure he faced many of the tough decisions that you're all facing here tonight. <clears throat> the question is, why am I telling you all this? I'm sad to admit to you that I don't send my kids to the public school here. When my wife, my, 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 when my wife and I moved here several years ago, we moved here because of the great reputation of the Edgewater school system. But when we toured the Edgewater Elementary School to be specific, we were really dismayed at the condition of the school. <clears throat> um, you know, quite frankly, it was it was uh, it was the the building is dilapidated, it's depressing. Um, not to mention all of these other health and safety concerns that people have already mentioned, uh, which we found about found out about later on. Um, this wasn't the public school system that I had grown up with. This wasn't the public school system that my uh, experience and my wife had experienced either. And it certainly wasn't the experience that we were going to give to our children. We fully intend on sending our children to Central Middle School and hopefully South River High. Although, although it will likely be too late for my children to attend a new Edgewater Elementary, I'd ask you to look at the future, look towards the future, and consider those families like mine who will come after us. Furthermore, all options that have been discussed today will bring the school utilization to an acceptable level. However, there was only one option discussed today that will actually allow for future growth and not force communities such as Poplar Point, Homeport, and many others who have expected to send their children to the Edgewater schools that may be redistricted as a result of the overpopulation of the school. Mr. Rivers, you need to wrap up. Your time is up. Sure. Uh, anyways, I'm fearful uh, without addressing the issue of the future growth that children like mine will be forced to go to, the school, uh, go to other schools that we certainly did not uh, intend to send them to. Although replacing the schools may, although replacing the school may be more expensive, I'd strongly encourage you not to throw good money after bad money by only doing a revital, revitalization and instead replace this, replace this school as needed. Thank you for your time and consideration. Good afternoon, Superintendent Arlotto, President Korbelak, and board members. My name is Sarah Little, and I want to thank you for supporting us in our work to fund construction of a new Edgewater Elementary now, rather than later, as the county executive proposed. Thank you for your testimony, your speeches, your interviews, and tweets on our behalf. We at Edgewater are still counting on you today. This is it. The Feasibility Committee selected the replacement option in line with the MGT study. The superintendent has re recommended revitalization, which is not in line with the MGT study. If you turn to page 57 of the Feasibility Study, the revitalization option has only six advantages and a whopping 20 disadvantages. What strikes me is that these so-called advantages have nothing to do with educating students. For example, one of the advantages is that we can reuse the existing parking area and drop-off. While this may be a construction advantage, the parents hate the drop-off and parking because it backs up into the Mayo intersection. The other advantages are that we get a courtyard and new toilets. We can also retain our terrazzo floors. And that's about it. You know the committee is grasping at straws when they have to resort to listing new toilets as an advantage. Anything would improve our bathrooms, and if you've seen our terrazzo floors, they're hardly worth featuring in architectural digest. Most concerning, however, is that my children will be forced to attend school in a construction zone in buildings and trailers that are already deficient as it is. This will be no place to learn or teach. And if it's bad for my children, it will be just as bad for those at Richard Henry Lee and Tyler Heights. 
I ask that you reflect on the mistakes made in this county in anticipating growth and the stress it has placed on our infrastructure. We can be part of that one third of schools who get a replacement. I hope you will see that we need to make difficult choices now in line with the MGT study so that future students and parents don't have to keep having these fights. I will conclude with a note about redistricting. We have fought so long for a new building and now we're forced to fight to keep our families in it. I think we can find solutions to redistricting within the respective clusters. We're counting on you to help us elevate all students now, in the future, north of the river and south. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. I also am a little, my remarks don't, I've listened to what you've said today and I've listened to all the comments and I'm not sure my original remarks would be quite on the mark, but I want to take some time to address what I still see to be the problem with the revitalization project, which I don't feel has been really discussed. One of the main things that I see, because I have an architecture background and I sat there and I looked at that plan and they talked about how the revitalization will bring everything within 10% of ed specs, but it doesn't. The cafeteria is 12% of ed specs, even with the revitalization plan. So it's smaller even before we start. The cafeteria has always been small. We get a little bit bigger, but we still don't get that as much as to be expected. <laughs> the other big concern, I think, is the parking lot and the drop-off area. I think it is a mistake to spend $25 million and not address those areas. They add 80 staff parking spots in the back of the building, but staff parking is not what we need. Those parking spots will not be accessible to the parents who need to use them. They will help before care and drop-off care before care and after care people, but they don't have an issue with the parking. They are not going to address the queue of parking lots or the queue of cars that backs up into the intersection. And that I think would be a mistake to go forward with a plan that doesn't address that. That's assuming that you can get rid of the mold issues and assure the kids safety while they're there. Um, as far as construction costs, I know it was talked about how revitalization costs, they're really good at renovation costs, they're really good at estimating what those are going to be. But my understanding is, and maybe we can get a clarification on this, that this report does not contain any contingency. That 25 million, I think, is just the cost without contingency. Um, according to page 80 of the, it says it does not contain contingency. So I fear that we're going to run up cost and get a building that doesn't meet current standards and won't cost us that much less in the end. And I think that would be a mistake. Thank you. Mr. Shacknovitz, I know that I have a couple questions. Could I? I think we're finished with the public comment. I'm concerned with the mold and the lead bait pen. We think can't drink that water. Is there anyone else that wanted to speak about Edgewater? I know I went through all the cards. Okay, so we're finished with the public comment on Edgewater. Um, I do, I do have a question. We were able to, some of us were able to visit Edgewater earlier, the, you know, back in September or August when they first, when we were touring new schools or schools, back to school schools. Um, we did see the walls that they're talking about with the growth that would be remediated and then come back two to three weeks later. Are those part of the cinder block walls that we're going to retain or? Well, again, are so they different? Are they part of the walls that are coming down? more than likely retain um, remember that the building itself the envelope of the building so the roof the windows uh, the masonry all of those will be uh, replaced the roof will certainly be replaced all the windows all the doors are going to be replaced um, insulation will be put in where it's required so the opportunities for moisture to enter into the building will be eliminated uh, for any for any biological matter to essentially exist and, and grow, it needs moisture, it needs water. Um, and by putting on new roofs, by fixing the envelope of the building, by putting in new windows, new doors, new thresholds, new door sweeps, et cetera, you've eliminated uh, any opportunities for water or humidity to get into a space. 
One of the folks who just spoke mentioned something about lead pipes. Are the pipes remaining as well, or are they coming out? No. As I said earlier, all of the mechanical systems, plumbing included there, all get replaced as part of any any option. So the building's coming off of the well system and all of the water uh, delivery uh, systems, both on the potable side for drinking or on the heating side, all of the piping gets replaced in the building. Was felt by the, the community committee to be the optimal solution. We applied that to all three sites, by and large. Um, again, parking, uh, 115 spaces in the ed spec without doing structured parking or putting it below the building. There's really no way to accomplish that. So we're taking uh, all, the, all the property that we can on that south end near the health center and assigning that to, to available parking of about 45 spaces in this case. Same goes for the fields. Um, whatever space is left, it's a, we're calling it a multi-purpose field. It doesn't meet the full ed spec requirement, um, but we're providing as much green space as we can to the rear of the building and the play areas uh, along B Street and 4th Avenue and behind the classroom wing. Uh, the diagram to the right shows the 3D perspective again. In this case, the dark blue represents the existing building to be re revitalized, and all the light blue blocks would be the um, one and two story additions to achieve the rest of the program areas. Moving down a page to the floor plans. One of the unique conditions about Richard Henry Lee is that it's essentially a, a split level condition right now. If you come in off the, the A Street entrance, you're going to come into the main administration area and then a, a encounter a, a, a large open centralized media center. You're then going to go down half a level to the, to the lower level classrooms and up half a level to the upper level classrooms. Within those clusters, each of those classrooms is essentially an open plan condition right now, separated by uh, systems, furniture walls, and um, uh, partial height partitions. So a lot of issues there with acoustics and, and um, programmatic separation of classroom spaces. So to help remedy that, we, we essentially need to build more classroom stock, and that's achieved here by way of a, a single loaded corridor that wraps a new courtyard space to the rear of the building. So we're repurposing that open plan classroom uh, condition in the back of the existing building, um, right-sizing those classrooms, providing the adequate circulation and enclosure to meet 21st century standards, and then providing more classroom stock to the back of the building uh, in this new addition. It should also be noted that in this revitalization, that area shown in the, the dash green box is that lower level plan. So as I'm approaching the building, go past admin and media in red and blue, respectively, I'm then going to go down that half a level. That condition is maintained in the revitalization. So it is still a, a two-story classroom wing in the back. Um, the additions would include um, the, the gym and before and after care to the rear of the building. Those would be accessed uh, from the student drop-off and the new uh, bus entry point that we introduced to the south of the building. Uh, the cafeteria is expanded with a new kitchen. And then at the front of the building, uh, where the current cafeteria is now, would be repurposed for the learning labs and expansion for a music room and the new mechanical electrical plant. And then moving upstairs, similar condition, we're uh, repurposing that, uh, that upper level open classroom plan, adding classroom stock in the back uh, to create uh, right-sized uh, classrooms that are closer to program target that ring this in internal courtyard around the academic wing. We'll go to option D now. That's going to be a few pages down. Perfect. Um, so this site plan is going to look similar to you from a, a vehicular standpoint. We're still bringing in cars from the A Street um, side, wrapping that uh, queue around to the uh, 4th Avenue uh, side on the north side of the building. Buses will come in again off A Street and exit on B Street. Um, the configuration of this plan is a little bit different because in this case we are actually um, trying to, uh, I would say, improve on the split level condition now and create a level entry, entry floor so that when you come in from the main entrance past admin and media, you now encounter a level um, uh, floor of classroom spaces on that on that main floor and then again on the upper floor. So you can see from the blocking diagram that light blue addition in the back is now up half a level to account for that uh, level change. Uh, moving into the floor plans, uh, again that sequence is, is going to be similar from, uh, from A Street. You're going to encounter admin health and guidance in red with a secure vestibule. The cafeteria is going to be um, uh, repurposed in its existing location with an expanded kitchen, new gym, and before and after care to the back, uh, and then music rooms beyond. Uh, that existing classroom bar that's behind the media center 
will then be com completely demolished and uh, reimagined as a level, double-loaded classroom wing with right-sized classrooms. Uh, this gets all of our early childhood on, on one level together, um, and then the first and second grade uh, wrapping the rest of that loop around the courtyard. The learning labs are going to be to the north, to the left, or to, the, to the right, I'm sorry, of the media center in this case, uh, with art in the bottom right corner. Upstairs, you'd repeat that. Uh, those classroom clusters for third, fourth, and fifth grade. Again, uh, a full level above um, what we just uh, reconfigured on the ground floor. Going to the replacement scheme. Very similar uh, site plan uh, configuration. Uh, unlike the, uh, the other two schools that we're presenting today, which um, are uh, very minor tweaks to the uh, two-story prototype that uh, we've done several times with you. This one actually has a, 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 I'd say, a more modified version of that to react to some of the physical site constraints that we have with this small property. Um, so it's a slightly different plan configuration, but the overall Part T, the overall diagram of the building remains the same. Um, in this case, we're trying to, again, maximize our availability of bringing buses onto the site from that south side, maximizing our parking here at 52 spaces, and then providing as much green space and play area um, along the B Street elevation to uh, the north and west uh, as we possibly can. But the uh, car and bus circulation is essentially similar to the other two schemes in this case. And of course, in this strategy, the entire building is uh, demolished and uh, built new in light blue. And in this condition, um, all of the students are taken off site since there's no room to, to stage on the property. So again, in the floor plan, scrolling down one page, I mentioned that the diagram is very similar to what we just saw in Edgewater. Um, common entry for um, uh, before and after care and admin through the secure vestibule. Uh, unlike some of the other projects where we try to bring uh, bus students from buses and from car drop off through that, that common entrance, we do need to bring uh, uh, bus traffic in from that secondary entrance, in this case in the upper left of your plan, um, which is the music corridor, as you'll know it from some of our recent prototypes. Um, so that, again, would be open only for drop-off and pick-up pick hours and then and locked the remainder of the day, funneling everybody back through that main vestibule for um, uh, the remainder of the school day. Uh, we've got a courtyard configuration here as well with first grade and early childhood on the ground floor, learning labs and art at the far end of the um, corridor to the north side of the building. And then upstairs, we've got clusters for second and third and then fourth and fifth grade, respectively, on the um, east and west wings. That's about it. All right. Do we have any board questions? Mrs. Birch? If we were to do a, um, a replacement on this one, and this is less of a construction issue and more of a process issue, where would the kids go to school? Uh, in all likelihood, uh, we're looking at uh, utilizing Corcoran Middle School. That would be uh, the most ideal in terms of room at proxi proximity. We've analyzed Corcoran Middle School. Just like for Arnold, we're co-locating with Magathy Severn Middle Schools. So uh, at all of these projects, we'd have to put some portables out there to help or modular buildings to help accommodate it uh, during the interim. But Corcoran Middle School would be the ideal. Uh, you certainly could move them to Chesapeake Bay Middle School. It has so more far. than enough space, but it's a very far drive, and, and we would not we don't believe that that's um, the right. best solution. So uh, utilizing the middle school that the children would ultimately attend and working with the administration of the yeah, two I mean, schools I, like we are at Magathy Severn or like we have uh, down at Southern Middle School, we think is probably the best option in this yeah, case. Because I was going through Annapolis, no. Right. Chesapeake Bay, no. Right. But so you might have enough space with portables to... With, now, right, it, portables and modulars. Is it a possibility, I mean, even with a revitalization that they might need to be moved? Yes. Okay. Yeah, again, the, and this is very different. If you think about West, we just opened West Annapolis. Um, many of you joined a superintendent that day. This really is, is analogous to that. Uh, there's very, very limited uh, site to store materials to access the, the project. Um, as, as uh, you know, was already stated, we will not have the, the full complement of uh, the, the correct size, multi-purpose room, et cetera, because uh, the site simply won't allow it. So this is, you know, if you put your West Annapolis hat on, this is almost the exact same project. And because of that, 
um, the, the designers and the constructors are going to have to very carefully uh, talk about things such as like just-in-time material deliveries mm -hmm. instead of big bulk deliveries and stacking things up and, eat, and you know, eating off of that stockpile. Right. We're going to have to be doing more deliveries. But that's, that's going to be true under all options because, again, just like in West Annapolis, we're constrained on all four sides by essentially street. There's just not a large area to do that. So we'll do our best. Um, but in all the options, having the, the students off premises will facilitate the most ra our ability to, to quickly renovate or replace the building and get them back into uh, the new environment. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Summer? Um, we visited all three of these schools like in June and Richard Henry Lee, I totally empathize with y'all all of these schools need a lot this is the one that I found as a parent and as a former teacher to be the most challenging building just the layout and the lighting and then I feel for y'all as engineers and architects because there's no room there to do anything I mean they y'all are right on the street so this is the one that is the most challenging and the needs the most, I think, to make it an educational, educationally viable, <laughs> is that a way to put it? So this is a tough one for either way. I don't think the site itself lends itself to doing the optimum of what we'd like to do just because of the limited space that we have there. So this is a very difficult one. I'm glad to hear that there is an option for off-site. I thought that there was no option at all for them to go somewhere because our regular places are so far away. I know it's not ideal, but there is an opportunity that they could be, so thank you for that. Right. So in terms of the overall project, just to juxtapose this one to the one we previously saw, from a site, from a constructability of the overall site, this is clearly much more challenging than, than either of the other two projects we're going to discuss today. But in terms of constructability on the inside, this one's far easier, actually, because unfortunately, and I, I mean that sincerely, unfortunately, it's an open space building. So think about it's just you know a big open space right now between the concrete floor and the concrete roof and the masonry walls. So going into the building, it's actually easier to renovate it because there's really not much there. We just move out the partitions and a desk that have unfortunately you know been a situation there for so long and go in and create you know proper classrooms and proper interior finishes and proper separation so while the site is very much working against us in a renovation scenario the lack of heavy masonry interior walls actually is aiding in getting the interior part of that work done and looking at this and I'm correct in saying that a revitalization will actually give more uh, 9,000 more square feet for the for things to be worked am I look reading that correctly it says revitalization will have 99,000 square feet but a replacement would only have 90,000 square feet so yes, there and, and again as, as we said earlier so this is you know this is the feasibility study and then as we move through the succeeding phases just like with any project be it a brand new building like Crofton or being a renovation project, we'll continue to refine uh, all those designs. This is, you know, given the level of effort that goes into a feasibility study, you know, this is the best solution set that we've arrived at at this juncture. But when we bring in many more resources and spend much more time on the project and bring in a lot more subject matter experts and working with the community administration, we'll continue to refine the entire building the end product I guarantee you will be while this is good the end product is always better it was uh, West Annapolis as it sits today if you went back and looked at the feasibility study you'll see so many similarities Miss Harmer but you'll see so many ways that we found opportunities to create improvements on that school and and I remain absolutely confident that Richard Henry Lee would present that same scenario because they always have Thank you. I don't have any more board questions, but I have Melissa Phillips and Judy Van Horn.
good afternoon.
All right, we'll be back. We're back in session. Do we have every? Or do we have enough people to be back? Yeah, we still. do. We have five. Um, item four point zero nine is the Tyler Heights Elementary School feasibility study. This is an information to action item. Do I have a motion to move it from information to action? So Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, we now have an action item, but we don't have our team. <laughs> We need the action. So much, you want me to present it? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he just said. There, uh, there comes Alex. All right. <laughs> That's right. Dr. Alato, your recommendation, please. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. As Alex approaches the table, um, <laughs> I am. I recommend approval of option C, revitalization. So moved. Second. All right. Now we're ready for a presentation. Oh, say all in favor. Are all in favor? No, we're not ready to. No, to move it to. to move oh no 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 we no we're not. That. Oh, okay. okay. We're Thank having you. a presentation. We've gotten out of rhythm. So we'll begin with the executive uh, summary that's on print page 15 in the uh, full presentation, and uh, we'll begin at the top. This pertains to item uh, 4.09, which is the feasibility study for Tyler Heights Elementary School. Option B, the patch and paint option, begins with an existing building of 45,813 square feet. Uh, the patch and paint, remember, is the cosmetic uh, enhancement only, no programmatic fixes, no system fixes, no component replacement, no additions, et cetera. Uh, the cost of that is approximately $2.3 million. Uh, initially, with a 40-year life cycle cost, at that total cost of ownership, again, of uh, just over $8.2 million, and will take about 12 months to execute. Option C, revitalization, then begins with that existing 45,813 square foot building. We would demolish uh, 5,184 square feet of that building. We would comprehensively renovate 40,629 square feet of that building. We would construct 50,064 square feet of new space, bringing the building to a total of 90,693 square feet. At a cost, at an initial cost of $22.7 million and a 40 year life cycle cost of $33.2 million. That project would take approximately 24 months to uh, execute. Option D, modernization, begins with an, an, that initial 45,813 square foot building. In this case, we'll be demolishing 22,189 square feet, comprehensively renovating 23,624 square feet constructing a new 73,173 square feet, bringing the total area to just under uh, 96,800 gross square feet at a uh, bid day cost of $31.7 million with a 40 year life cycle cost of $42.3 million. That would take 24 <coughs> months. Um, the final option, option E, is replacement. We would uh, demolish the entire 45,813 square foot building. We would construct a new prototype facility of approximately 96,027 square feet at a cost of $34.1 million with a total 40 year life cycle cost of $44.1 million. That would take approximately 27 months. In all uh, cases, we would envision that the students at uh, Tyler Heights would be relocated to uh, Annapolis uh, Middle School. Uh, there is just uh, slightly short of the space required, so we would be uh, putting some uh, swing, uh, some portable space at Annapolis Middle School to allow that to uh, occur. We can go now through the three options in a little bit more detail. On print page 60, you'll begin with the site plan for the Tyler Heights Elementary School under option C revitalization you'll see that the uh, that the light the lightly or tan shaded area is the existing building in this case the dark orange building around uh, to the plan right and north will be the new square footage that we'll be um, constructing you'll see behind a school in dashed lines a number of uh, small rectangle spaces those are the uh, relocatable buildings that currently exist at the school. In this scenario, the uh, parking lot and car drop-off area will be enhanced. However, um, in the front of the building, keeping that new main entrance in newly constructed space, 
to the far right um, of your drawing, we'll be constructing a brand new uh, bus drop-off area, so there will be no overlap between uh, the bus drop-off area and the parking for staff and visitors, in this case. To the right, you'll see that um, three-dimensional diagram that simply depicts the existing single-story uh, building in the darker blue hue, and then in the light blue hue, you'll see the uh, newly constructed spaces. Going over to the very next page, you'll begin now drilling down in detail into the space planning aspects of it. The areas with the heavily dashed uh, uh, line is the footprint of the existing building, which will remain. You'll see in the upper left-hand corner, we'll be constructing a four-room addition to extend that existing building if you recall, that lower left portion of the building is where the existing school has its multi-purpose room. That entire area there, that public assembly space, will be repurposed, and art and the learning labs uh, will go into that space. The admin area currently is in that lower left-hand corner, as I mentioned earlier. That is going to be relocated completely into newly constructed space. It's going to be flipped to the right in terms of the entrance. So we're going to reconfigure that area. All of the high volume spaces, the before and after cares, the gym, the cafeteria, et cetera, the new kitchen, the new stage mechanical, all of that's going to be constructed new from scratch on the right hand side of the plan. And then finally, going across the enclosed back end of the corridor, we'll cr create a circulation, a loop configuration. You'll see that's where all the uh, early ed, uh, the ECI, the pre K, the K, and that is done purposely so that they can access the playgrounds that are uh, um, appropriate for them, the pre-K areas there. Uh, the courtyard will allow for natural light into all of those spaces. You see there, there are no areas that really don't have a perimeter wall, so we'll be able to enhance uh, the lighting within that. I will turn it over to my colleagues uh, to pick up with option D. Now, uh, now beginning, with, beginning with the site plan, for um, the modernization option. Okay, apologies for being a few minutes late, folks. Thanks for being patient. Um, so the modernization scheme uh, does take a, a little bit of a different twist than the revitalization. We actually uh, bring that uh, main entrance uh, ma is maintained on the southwest portion of the building where it currently resides and is expanded and enhanced. Um, the uh, parking lot is expanded uh, to accommodate all 115 spaces in the ed spec, and that gives us a nice long car queue, which we know is a major issue for, for all schools, but uh, this neighborhood's no exception. So that red dash line represents the car queue that can uh, be pulled through the parking lot and, and stay on site. The bus drop off is, is uh, on the western portion of that site at that bend and jan wall, and you'll see the dashed line of the existing annex building, which is where the uh, fourth grade currently resides as a separate cluster. And that, that, that annex building is under every scenario correct. that annex building is being demolished in its entirety. So taking advantage of that newfound real estate, which is that grade with the, with the rest of the building uh, complex, we can uh, pull a separate bus loop off of there and get uh, kids off the bus and into that main entry near the car drop off area as well. Um, the other thing that this uh, plan uh, tried to do is for fire apparatus and emergency vehicle access and service access is to try to create that perimeter, perimeter loop um, around the full building, which we always try to do in our replacement schools where the site will allow us to. So you can see that we're just skirting the property line there, but we are able to in this building configuration to get that loop all the way around from a operation standpoint that's uh, uh, high priority if you can pull it off. That gives us room in the back of the site uh, to the north and the west for the uh, play areas and multi-purpose fields. Moving into the floor plan. So again, you can see that uh, the dash line uh, representing the, the existing footprint here. We're doing a significantly uh, deeper demolition um, pass at the building. So we're, we're keeping that front bar of the building. We heard from the construction committee that it was very important, if possible, to bring the early childhood classrooms, K and pre-K, up to the front of the building where they can um, manage access and security and um, keep their eyes on the little guys a little more easily. So we endeavored to do that in this plan. That gave us the ability to reimagine what the rest of the academic wing would be. Um, so going over to the right side of the plan, uh, again, beyond the dash line is all addition. Brand new media center in the bottom right. 
uh, facing the, the street front for good public access, and then actually a, a two-story block of classrooms, uh, not, unsimilar, not dissimilar to the, what we would do in the replacement school. Um, in this case, you've got grades two and three on the ground floor, and then grades four and five above. And then in the back bar of the building that connects uh, the back side of the courtyard would be grade one, um, and then the learning labs and art rooms. And circling back to the um, front of the building would be the, the larger public areas, the gym and cafeteria, and the music wing, all of which are encircling a, a large central courtyard for outdoor education. And you can see the second floor plan shows the upstairs of that efficient two-story bar with fourth and fifth grade. We'll flip down to the uh, option E replacement, please. So here we go to, um, again, separated cars and buses. We uh, accommodate parking on the, on the south side of the site uh, using the existing uh, curb cut and expanding that parking over again to where the annex building used to be, where that would be demolished. That gets us our full um, parking count there. And then the bus loop would be positioned over to the east side of the site. Uh, both cars and buses would funnel into the common main entrance uh, vestibule for the two-story prototype. Um, this, as you can see, would require um, uh, swinging the kids off-site uh, during construction so that the contractor would have uh, free reign of the, of the property to go about their construction activities. I think the rest of the floor plan we've, we've gone over in, in detail. We'd be glad to take any questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Mrs. Hummer. One of the sites, I'm just curious what this means. There's a, a little part that says C O L L learn. What is that? So that's a it's a collaborative learning area. It's Oh, okay. Um, I was trying to figure out what that stood for. Okay. So it's found space for informal learning near the uh, uh, academic clusters for okay. teachers to do small group pullouts uh, during the, the All right. school day. How many Kindergartens are currently at Tyler Heights. Do we know? So we're going to go back to the uh, existing There's, plan. They have three, and then we have. Do we have three pre-Ks that are off-site right now? Correct. Georgetown East, I believe. Okay. Yeah. So is that's my big question: is looking at the early childhood. Do we have enough of the early childhood classes, knowing that population and the current number of pre-K kids have that we have, and we may want to add have we built in enough early childhood classrooms? Right, so I mean in the early ed space we're going from an existing complement of five up to seven. One of the other complications that they have at the existing schools are many of those rooms were inappropriately sized. They were simply too small to perform their desired functions. Mm -hmm. So the, the new building uh, will have, uh, have more of those uh, facilities and be more appropriately sized. So we have the opportunity to, so say, let's say currently right. we have six. So if we have three kindergartens and three pre-Ks and we could add right. another. Additionally, the existing school uh, does not have ECI, but we envision that the new facility would because there are youngsters that could benefit from that support. And as you know, ECI services children that are even earlier than the, the pre-K age. Right, so, so that would be, so again, that's my question, is seven enough classroom for that? The, uh, look, looking at the demography, that's that's really what's supportable uh, from our long-range planners and okay. as well as the uh, state's long-range planners. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sasso. Yes, looking at this specific school, and I must say the other two, we do have issues with the building itself, and I know that if we had money, we would just rebuild them. But with this, I'm looking at it, there's three areas that really concern me, and maybe you can explain. Mm -hmm. One is when you state the construction code, it will have a construction code impact. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Can you point us to where you are in the report? Please? Yes, uh, I'm page 34, comparison of options, and it says potential for unforeseen conditions which could increase, I'm sorry, requires analysis of existing structure to assess code impacts. So in, in any case, when we're doing a revitalization or modernization, our structural engineers, as Alex said earlier, are gonna do, we do a 
investigation of the existing documents that are available to us and then a, a, a field visit, uh, an on-site investigation. We're not doing destructive uh, you know, investigation any, any deeper than that at this phase. Um, with any, again, modernization or revitalization, the structural engineer would need to go through a, a more, a more in-depth analysis of the existing structure. Um, that obviously gets more intense if you're increasing your, your live loads above, above the building, if you're going to go up multiple floors, which in this case we're not, so that's good. Um, it keeps things simpler, but there will be an analysis that needs to be run to make sure that we're up to current codes from a structural standpoint. We're not saying that we're not. We're just saying that we need to go through that study It's just that detail. I didn't see it any, in any of the other ones. Okay. Right, so in, in you know, two very pertinent examples, for example, uh, currently, like the, uh, the, the level of wind force that a, new, that a building today has to withstand the roof of a current building is higher than what the code was previously. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the snow loads on top of a roof, now those codes are more stringent than they were before. The structural engineers know that those codes are more stringent now. They will analyze in a much l greater level of detail and run the calculations on the existing uh, beams and bar joists, et cetera, on a item by item basis, piece by piece basis, and see which, if any, of those individual components may need to be beefed up, augmented, or possibly replaced such that the roof of that building can withstand both the new snow load mandate and the new wind uplift mandate. So those are just two examples, but that's, that's on every project that we do, we'll do the same thing. Okay, but this sentence was not on every single one before. That's why I was asking this one. Also, um, I can see the unforeseen since there's unforeseen, but the another issue is basically what you put here, it's not a green building. It's less energy efficient. It is a fire hazard for the children. And you stated here, fire lane cannot encircle that building. So that, that's not a fire hazard. It's an operational issue. So the code requires that you reach each, every, every portion of an exterior envelope of the building mm -hmm. within a certain distance. The vehicle has to get within a certain number of feet of the building, and then they have what's called a hose drag rule. So yeah. they extend where the vehicle stops with the hose drag. The design that's there absolutely complies with the fire codes of the city of Annapolis and the state of Maryland. It is more optimal to have a and circulation circle. route that you can actually drive around what the fire apparatus would have to do here would be a three-point turn or back up. So it meets all of the codes. So it's not a code issue about whether it is or isn't complying with the fire codes of the state of Maryland or the fire codes of the city of Annapolis. It's an operational issue for the driver of that apparatus, whether they can more easily drive a, a loop or whether when they're finished, whatever task they have at hand, they're gonna have to either back up or do a three-point turn. Okay, since so it's we it's not are, a fire hazard. I really want to, okay. you know, dispel since that. Since we are basically removing that extra building and that's the side, why can't the extra loop be finished around there? Is it a space to the boundaries? Yes, if, if you can go back to uh, the option C site plan, please. Make one more, there we go. Um, you can see the, the, the two water towers side by side on Janwell yep. there. That's, you'll see where the property line jogs in around those towers. Yes. That's really preventing us at, from, from completing that, that bus loop around the building, okay. or that, that fire lane around the Is building. Is that the city land? Yes, ma'am. The city owns the land that the water towers sit on. There's no way the city can give us a little piece of land to put it around? I mean... I really that, consider that, it a hassle to not, not have the fire lane all the way around. That's certainly something we could explore with the city administration. I mean, we can't obligate them to do that, but as we get further into the design stage, and remember that the city officials are going to be part of the review process as well. This project is in the city of Annapolis instead of the county, so their um, you know, planning authorities, their code officials, uh, all of the subject matter experts, their fire marshal will be integrally involved in that. and. Uh, they may also be able to assist us in having those conversations with the city administration. Good. I like that point. I would like to see it go all the way around. Okay. <laughs> we, would, we, would as, we would as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you also have that the plan revitalization plan will have more impact to the trees. And the reason I'm asking is because when you take down a tree, you have to put up another tree. 
so there's an existing tree stand on the uh, north east side of the property where it uh, adjoins the adjacent neighborhood uh, and the revitalization just because of how much space we need to meet our parking yeah. needs our, our, our bus drop-off needs um, and fire lane needs it we're impinging on that that tree line more than we would need to in the replacement scheme okay but the reason I'm asking I live in the city so I know how the city you know you take down one tree and you have to put up one so has that been taken into consideration how much it's going to cost us to put up more trees right we, yes. we have to mitigate and and that's the the county ordinance and the city ordinance both have those offset mitigation requirements so you either have to mitigate on site or you can mitigate off premises or do a fee and lose so there's three ways under the code to be able to accomplish that requirement and we'll work collaboratively with the city to see which of those three options are the best but in our in our detailed estimate we did account for that as a line item from a cost standpoint to make sure that's covered okay. <laughs> and then let's see as far as education is concerned not all space meet program requirements does that mean that it's more than 10 percent no, no it, it, it means yeah. it's within that 10 percent band and it could be neither direction it could be larger than what the ed spec required or it could be smaller than what the ed spec smaller, required because the classrooms are smaller right but it we try to keep it within that 10 percent um, band on either side but see the question is it appears here in this statement but it doesn't appear on the others on the other two schools so the average if you if on your in your yeah. document okay example for an average classroom our ed spec calls for 850 square feet okay. there's 20 conventional classrooms in the ed spec at 850 square feet under the revitalization plan there are 20 classrooms in fact but the average size of those 20 classrooms is 847 square feet so okay. it's only three square feet per gotcha. the average that's yes. the average but across all 20 it's only three square feet less than what the ed spec requires but it doesn't meet the ed spec okay. in the modernization we will endeavor to find three more square feet okay. so thank you i don't have a question but i i thought it was important to note that alderman kirby from the city had been here earlier uh, and that he had had a chance to look at this and was supportive of the superintendent's recommendation yes ma'am that's correct all right do we have any public comment on this item Lisa Van Busker from Edgewater. I just think we all recognize that anything you do for Tyler Heights is an improvement, so certainly don't go back to patch and paint. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all those in favor of revitalization for Tyler Heights. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you all. Item 4.10 is an information to action item, the Carrie Whedon Science Center Foundation, Inc. lease extension. Do I have a motion to move this from information to action? Second. All those in favor? We now have an action item. Dr. Olato, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend the board approve uh, approval of the Carrie Whedon Science Center Foundation Incorporated lease extension. All right, do we have any board questions or comments? Or are we doing a presentation? No, ma'am, I believe that, that the exhibit uh, clearly articulates the four, uh, the four changes. The, my, the major changes are it extends the existing lease from a uh, maximum termination date of June 30th, 2016 to 2017. The second uh, amendment is an amendment to paragraph four of the existing lease, and the key phrase is the very end. So it allows uh, access to the facility and to the programs. What's newly added is the last few words, and I'll quote, without cost to Board of Education students, end quote. The third modification occurred to existing paragraph five. It adds a brand new sentence that says, and I'll quote again, further, the Board of Education shall be permitted access to the facility for maintenance, renovation, modifications, or improvements. And finally, uh, under item number four, there's a change to paragraph 15 that uh, allows um, the, uh, the Board of Education upon 60 days written notice to the foundation to terminate uh, the lease uh, for the facility. And I'll, that's simply a paraphrase. 
all other remaining elements of the existing uh, lease document that was in, a, in effect as of June 30th of 2016 continue uh, to this day and all these uh, lease amendments have uh, um, been reviewed by board council as well. Ms. Sasso. Alex, can you let us all know what is the lease or the consideration that they pay for leasing this building? Uh, there is there is not a uh, the consideration was at the onset of the of the foundation when they took on the building back in 1999 uh, they committed to undertaking some uh, improvements to the facility that essentially was the consideration in the legal term that was the consideration that was exchanged at that time for them uh, being allowed to utilize the Do facility. Do they pay anything for rent for lease? No ma'am. So have they fulfilled their obligation of their consideration of the maintenance of the building? Yes, they have. Okay, thank you. All right, I don't have any other board questions. I have two cards from the public, Rick Derrick and Sharon Solberg. good morning but it's good afternoon you guys are like everybody bunnies I don't understand how you do it thank you and thank you for being here for us uh, I'm the treasurer of Cary Weedon Science Center Foundation and I'm here to request that you consider changes to the proposed leased extension terms I believe you're aware that Cary Weedon Science Center Foundation and the board entered into this partnership in the 90s to provide much needed hands-on science education to the children in the county. We've been doing this for over 25 years because we did a little bit before then, and we believe quite successfully. I might add that in the past, this board was enormously helpful in designing and approving curriculum, advertising school in the school system for us, and even providing materials and equipment for Cary Wheaton Science Center. Thank you, it was a wonderful partnership. Last spring, as you plan to move forward to convert the Cary Whedon School building to a pre-K facility, efforts were enacted to require further study as to the wisdom of this effort. Our board was given assurance that a lease extension would be provided with terms similar to previous agreements, with added language allowing you act to access the facility a little easier at any time. Accordingly, we ramped up our efforts to advertise that we would be open for at least another year with the associated fee structure and reservation availability. This has yielded 20 field reservations for this year, and so far uh, some have already been completed, but most are scheduled in the future. Only now, four months after our lease expir expiration, have lease amendments been received, and one of these provisions prevents us from charging our normal fee for service. Definitely not a major alteration, and one quite onerous to us. We question this provision in the light of other fees charged at other similar Board of Education facilities, such as Maryland Hall, regular after-school programs, and overnight costs at Arlington Echo. We thus re request that you consider three changes to the lease extension. Do you, you have a copy in front of you? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the same three that, that uh, I Alex. Thank you. Alex just talked about. Number two, delete the final seven words. This is what we're really going for. <laughs> delete without cost to Board of Education students. This allows us to proceed in our normal business fashion and remain viable as we have for the past over 25 years. Number three, add provision such provided such access does not impact Carrie Whedon Science Center Foundation's ability to accomplish its mission. This guarantees us the ability to have our kids there and do our work without being um, impaired by something happening that's in there. And number four, we suggest we delete paragraph 15 entirely. The original lease called for an 18-month notification period, whereas the board wanted to take the building back since you were given to us for free. Uh, you could do that, but you had to give us 18-month notification. With only eight months remaining on our lease, early termination, as mentioned in paragraph 15, becomes a moot point. I believe these changes will clarify the lease terms appropriately as promised earlier. Thank you. Same thing. I was, when I, we were supposed to talk this morning, I thought, 
Holly, I hope they're not hungry now. I'm worried that you might be sleepy. <clears throat> uh, I am Sharon Solberg. I am the program director, um, the lead teacher, and the chief centipede chaser. Thank you for your service. And <clears throat> again, like the other uh, people who have spoken already, you guys are doing a, a hard job, a big job, an important job. And I thank you for your service. It's a lot of time. I know it's a lot of work and probably very frustrating. But I appreciate your caring about our county's children and getting their best opportunities for learning. We're on the same page. We too at Cary Whedon want to provide great opportunities for learning science. Our curriculum is aligned with the county science curriculum so that we can work with teachers in augmenting what's already being taught in the classroom. Teachers tell us frequently that we, they get so much science in that day with us that it's a lot more than they can accomplish in the classroom, plus getting hands-on activities. They express how hard it is to get in science in their day, and they don't always have all the materials that we have. And the teachers, too, have learned from the trips. Uh, children are natural scientists. They are curious and they learn by doing. And we help direct that intuition. When they come to Cary Whedon, they touch, they observe, they record, they develop questions, and they get really, really excited about science. We often hear things like, well, well I want to be a scientist when I grow up now. Wow, I didn't know science could be so much fun. And the last one is, do we have to leave? We say, yes. The parents, too, who come are very enthusiastic about their experience at Cary Whedon. They, too, feel that kids don't get enough science. It's just hard to get enough science. We've had chaperones who are teachers who end up bringing their classes there. We've had a middle school teacher who came as a chaperone, and she said, oh, man, I really wish my kids had been here for learning how to write a hypothesis, how to create uh, good experiments and the parents find too that they oh this is all that this is what it takes to make a science fair project they get a lot of um, teaching in too so sometimes we have to hold the parents back from doing the experiments they have a great time but they they want to do it too so the other thing that we hear a lot is that they like that the kids are safe it's a small safe environment the kids are working, they see where they are, and they don't have to worry about losing them. So, and when the classes come, they're also treated to time in our taxidermy room, where we have a collection of um, animals valued over a million dollars, um, including black bear. Okay, I know that's hard for me to stop, and I'm a teacher. Um, but they, when they go to the live room, they get to hold live animals, they get up close, they get personal. And our policy has always been that kids who cannot afford can come for free. And the cost of the trip, I know, is, is an issue. We try to keep the prices down. And we also uh, offer, we've had to have, actually, Tyler Heights was one of those schools that came for a half price. They have a lot of kids who are in free and reduced lunch. And we made arrangements for them to come. We know that some. I need you to uh, wrap up your comments, please. Okay. We have that some schools only have one field trip, and they choose us. We also hear of schools that have three and four field trips, so and money's not an issue. Bottom line is we feel very strongly that our program is worth your expense. Thanks. Thank you. I just have a, I have a question about our students who go to Maryland Hall. Uh, during the school day are they charged during the school day or just for the after school and evening weekend sorts of classes that they offer it's my understanding that uh, we utilize uh, parts of the Maryland Hall facility during the day they're not charged for that Maryland Hall uh, folks have utilized some of the space in our Chesapeake Arts wing that's directly behind uh, the school we don't charge them so it's a symbiotic relationship they have a lot of artists and residents um, mm -hmm. that they have those artists and residents sometimes are located out in the main Maryland Hall building the youngsters come out sometimes they push into the school and the artists and residents will go into the school building and utilize the art room that's in the Bates Middle School and 
conduct the, the art experiments or the music uh, uh, lessons inside of our building. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty, uh, it's an integrated feature. Mm -hmm. Now there are many other programs that Maryland Hall runs um, during the day, they're optional, they're not part of our curriculum. The during the day, after the day, weekends, some of those they charge for, some of those they don't, but they're not programs that we compel our students to attend. Okay. Uh, Dr. Frank? Um, as a, a fellow that has a scientific background, thank you very much for being here. I hope at some time I'll have a chance to uh, uh, visit your facility, but uh, I'd like to uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Olada or someone else if they have any particular concerns with Carrie Wheaton. I don't think I've heard any. Certainly these are, these are conversations we've had many times as a board uh, and over the last now two and a half years and certainly I've met with the folks that, that stand in front of you and a number of others over the time as has Mr. Shaknovich and others and so our concern <laughs> is not with the Kerry Whedon program our concern is with the Kerry Whedon program <coughs> occupying that space that we would like to now use for a pre-k program so their program is is welcome to exist anywhere it's it's uh, they're 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 welcome to take their program um, anywhere that it, that works for them and students and, and want to continue their program, but it's not our concern with the program, Dr. Frank. It's the space we'd like to. If that's a school building that this board owns. We'd like to take that building back and convert it back into a school, which it hasn't been for many years. That's our concern. If uh, Kerry Wheaton um, has a concern about a facility. Uh, has there been any collaboration of what would happen next? We've talked about it, um, and also I think that has been suggested by uh, this board that we look into Discovery Village uh, to see what we can do there. And that's another decision the board makes. We love where we are. There's a lot of uh, synergy there, and so we're, we have to make that decision. And that we'll do this year, as I assume you're also looking into feasibility as to should you really do this conversion, as my son Lee, who was a first speaker way back in the morning, you know, he maintains there are other options there as I maybe perceive possible too, rather than jump whole hog right now. And that would give us a little bit more time. But depending on what happens with that study, then we'll decide whether to continue or fold our tent and, or go someplace else. And if I could just jump in on that point, because um, uh, your son Lee was speaking earlier and I just wanted to try and clarify some of the points. There are two major points. He may have actually made three major points. First was that he's very involved in South County, which is absolutely true. Um, the other two points, one was, um, uh, and, and I don't have him here to speak to it, but one of his major points was that Lothian currently, well, under the, because of the new construction, has about 100 seats extra, and that's places that we could put pre-K. Um, uh, there may be a difference in state rated capacity, and there might be 100 seats. I don't know what the number is, but those aren't seats for pre-K. Right now, the pre-K seats, because it's the size of the room, the configuration of the room, the height of the counters, is different in a fifth or third grade classroom than it is a pre-K. So there might be, by state rated capacity, open seats, and I, this is really for the board to understand, um, but they're not pre-K eligible seats. And for pre-K currently, so that's the point one. The second one was that there were some concerns and because because right now the pre-K is full. There is a single classroom that's split afternoon and morning or morning and afternoon, and that's full. Um, uh, 20 students in the morning and 20 students in the afternoon. The other was that um, uh, a concern that was shared, and you may have the same concern as your son, is that Lothian um, is currently taking in more, and these are my words, not his, but taking in more students that are um, not poverty, more students of, of uh, means, families of yeah. wealth, of, right. means, of means, was a word, thank you, of means. Mm -hmm. um, and we went back, I just wanted to check and, and clarify for the board. Um, there are various levels, a level one student, uh, category one student is a student that is in poverty. Um, of the 40 students, 32 of those are in poverty. We have to offer those seats up first. Once the poverty seats are filled, then we have to go back and we can fill with then students that are receiving special education uh, services, ESOL services, and then open it up to anybody else. So of the 40 seats, currently 32 are filled with students of uh, students coming from poverty. Thank you. Ms. Sasso. Since I haven't been on the board for too long, I would like to address the item number three that he stated, and I haven't seen their contract completely, that he says paragraph 15, it's an 18 month notification. Have they been notified? I haven't seen the contract. Uh, the, 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 ori the original contract that was 
crafted and signed in 1999 uh, had a 18-month provision to it. That contract expired many years ago, and we've been doing a, a year-to-year lease now for about the last three cycles. So clearly, if you're doing a 12-month a, a lease, having an 18-month you know, termination clause is, is not it's not even logistically practical. The the construct, and as Mr. Bennett probably will will uh, aid, all lease provisions basically have a have a duration. I've never not seen a lease agreement that doesn't have a duration provision, and but then my has question a termination is, okay, provision. Now, looking at this one, mm -hmm. and I'm going back to real estate contractual agreements as a broker in Mar Maryland. Mm -hmm. This agreement extends which agreement? The 1999 or the yes. previous? Then you are going back to it, the 1999 it, well, terms. Paragraph two only modifies paragraph two. Paragraph two previously But is was, paragraph 15 in the 1999 agreement? Yes. Then you are extending the 1999 agreement by contractual law. We're modifying paragraph 15 provide us new language. So yes, we're, yep. modif we're modifying the term and conditions that previously existed in paragraph okay. 15 of the 99 agreement and it's being replaced with this language. That's okay. part of the addendum. Okay, yeah. Yep. But this reverts back to the original contract of 1999. There... Even only, if you extended it, because see, you no. are mention mentioning here that contract in 1999. Right. So all of the terms of 1999 are in existence except for the modification you are required. Uh, there, ha there was also one other modification that occurred uh, three years ago that inserted new language for uh, uh, hold harmless and insurability requirements. Okay, but did it modify paragraph 15? No. No, okay. So this would be the only one trying to modify paragraph 15 provided they sign it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, I don't have any other questions from the board. All those in favor of this approval, approval of this lease extension, raise your hand. Okay, motion passes 7-0-0. We'll now move on to review items. Item 5.01 is the fiscal year 2016 operating budget closeout. So, uh, yes, ma'am, there is no uh, presentation. Our uh, FY16 uh, books have been closed out and audited. Um, by an independent external uh, auditor, Clifton Larson Allen. And this is the summary uh, of those closeout documents that depicts where we ended in terms of our um, uh, general funds, food service fund, capital project fund, non major governmental fund, and our total governmental funds, uh, and shows the changes from the close of the prior fiscal year to this fiscal year in terms of our general fund and our health insurance internal service fund. This document, uh, once uh, once reviewed by the board, will be transmitted to, uh, to both the state and the county agencies as well. So it's an annual requirement that uh, we present the uh, end results, much as you've received under separate cover, the full audited statements uh, and audited financial statements uh, that it was transmitted as required by law up to Baltimore prior to the 30th of September, and that also was shared with the appropriate state and county government officials. Dr. Frank? Um, if funds are not spent within uh, the appropriate year, can they be carried over, or what's the process for that? Or, do, or is that the, or are those funds closed? Okay, so in the operating budget, the operating budget actually closes on June the 30th. As part of our budget adoption process, we have to work with the county government to have those funds reappropriated. So if there are funds left over on the 30th of June, come the 1st of July, absent a vote of the county council and an appropriation authority being given, 
for that money, I cannot access that money. Similarly, on June 30th, the dollars reside in those 14 state categories. They have to reside in those 14 state categories. The only way for me to transfer money between the categories is also to go back to the county council and have them uh, adopt an ordinance that allows me the authority. So they have, uh, there's a categorical vote that's required by the council. Should I need to move monies between categories? And then there's an appropriation level vote that would recognize and allow me to access those fund balances. They're two very different things, but both of them require councilmatic action. Thank you. Mrs. Birch. So I can see that most of our fund balance is accounted for in some way. We are spending some of it on our um, 2017 appropriation encumbrances. What is an assigned use? To, to so an assigned use is um, signaling essentially an intent to use it at some point. So okay. for example, um, in, in that uh, handout on the fund balance, so you see two million for health care fund. Okay. So that is the administration signaling our intent to the board that at some point during fiscal 17, we'll be bringing a supplemental appropriation of $2 million to transfer from the general fund or the operating fund to the health care fund, which would then require both county executive introduction and county council approval. Okay. And similarly, the budget that this board adopted uh, in late June requires that we have a $13 million local funding obligation. So again, under the assigned right. category, you also find that $13 million of this fund has been explicitly right. identified and assigned to fulfilling that $13 million right. obligation. So out of all of that, the only thing that was unassigned is $2.963 million for emergencies, like something, you know, needing to clean up a school that has a fire or um, extra snow removal or oil spill. All, all those, yeah. an oil spill, we'll speak, yes. We'll see that momentarily. <laughs> okay, yes, things like that. And, and if my calculations are correct, that's about 0.29% of our budget? about that yeah. okay all right so we're we're ready for any emergency aren't we <laughs> uh, we're, we we run on uncomfortably far below industry I mean some people margins. might look at that and say why aren't you spending that 2.9 million dollars I'm looking at it as oh my gosh we only have 2.9 million dollars in case something goes wrong <laughs> but that's the way it goes we're and we're not like I mean some other entities get to keep a comfortable fund balance in case something goes wrong, but we're not really permitted to do that in the same way. Thank you. Mrs. Hummer. Yes, on the last page, the yellow, the yellow one. So our actual FY 2019 ending fund balance is 12.3. Why doesn't that 12 point, why isn't that our starting amount for the budget for sure. 2017? So the first three columns are actuals. Mm -hmm. The fourth column is budgeted. So this reflects the budget that the county council adopted and then that you ratified in June. When we go back to the county government in December, we go to the county government at least twice a year, second quarter and fourth quarter. When we go to the county government second quarter, we'll do what's called a second quarter transfer, ask the county executive to introduce legislation uh, and with the support, with the affirmative support of the council, they will then give us the appropriation authority for the difference between the 12.3 million and the 9.8 million. Okay. So when this document comes back to you in the second half of the fiscal year, it will then reflect 12.364 in the upper right hand column. But today I can't do that because that's A, not your adopted budget, and B, the council has not acted to give me the authority mm -hmm. to reflect that number above. Okay, thank you. I have a public comment card on this item, Lisa Van Buskirk. Good afternoon, Board of Education, Lisa Van Buskirk. We'll start school later. Uh, so my calculations is that you had nearly a 1.8 million increase between FY 15 and 16, uh, although you're spending a significant part of that, of which 602,000 was likely the money to be spent for this school year for start times. Next year, I anticipate there'll be about 475,000 available for the general fund from the state. 
law for schools no longer paying fuel taxes unless the, the, the board chooses to spend it on seven additional buses. Seven additional buses may be able to be used for one of the late releasing schools. For instance, Mead Heights currently uses six buses for its regular students and three for special needs. Surely seven new buses would allow that school to open at nearly the same time, if not earlier, while also freeing the existing buses to help at other late releasing schools as neighboring Hebron Harbor. The seven new buses could obviously be used more than once at Just Meet Heights. The possible arrangements of seven new buses are limited only by imagination, and the software could help. Software that was purchased in FY 2016. So I'd like to follow up on Dr. Arlotto's comment that it wasn't bought to develop start times. We may have different opinion yet that, but using the software, it can be used by motivated and trained people using the software can develop the start time solutions. AACPS's transportation staff is competent at what they do, which is to make sure buses show up on time, know their cluster routes and unique situations, and to make sure kids are picked up and dropped off at the right places, and not in as a ditch as Dr. Alardo loves to mansplain so much to SSL. There are operational issues, and these, the staff can tweak bus routes and add or more stops based on calls from parents, but developing a set of bus routes to implement healthy and safe school hours may be beyond their current level of training. So to meet the board's request that late schools be analyzed by this spring to see if they could be re-tiered, re it may take a little bit of outside help. <laughs> Howard County has been using transportation software for several years, but even they asked for outside help in developing potential new bell scenarios for the start time task force. They reached out to Dr. Ali Hagani of the University of Maryland, a well-respected civil engineer and logistician. His work was described to me as a brilliant and steps beyond what Howard County could do with their software alone. Or AACPS could draw upon the expertise of an Anne Arundel County company, School Bus Consultants, who helped Greenwich, Connecticut develop Bell scenarios for their start time committee. And it's based on School Bus Consultants' work last month that Greenwich, Connecticut voted a day after your vote, for which again I thank you, uh, to move start times. Um, also like to mention that of the two point nine million unassigned currently, it's not uh, by definition is not assigned, spoken for, or committed. Perhaps that's worth considering that a good faith use of this unassigned portion to pay for a few more buses to help those late releasing schools, this could help convince the county council to fully fund start times for whatever you ask for for FY 2018 for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, last winter, just exactly a year ago, you had a great forum with representatives from Fairfax and Montgomery County. I encourage uh, you to go back and remember their process and how they looked to do things and how they created a community plan for implementation. You have a start time task force from 2014. I encourage you to reintegrate that, get a couple more community members that represent, like Hillsmere is very upset about their delay, and other community members so that you can actually implement and adjust and address all the community's concerns from last winter. Thank you. Thank you. Item 5.02 is the monthly financial status report, also a review item. Are there any board questions or comments? Is there any public comment? All right. Item 5.03 is the construction status report, also a review item. Are there any board questions or comments? Is there any public comment? Nope. Mrs. Summer? So, um, I was looking through here and you know, it says approved budget, current appropriation encumbered and all those things. Um, I know you're really good at managing the money and coming in under budget. How much under budget are we on a lot of, on a lot of these things? Are we saving money? <laughs> well, he, yeah, he, That's true. here to four, we've, we've had a tradition of, as you know, a proud tradition of coming in under budget and on or under time on our projects. So we continue to endeavor to do that. <laughs> All right, item 5.04, award of contracts. Any board questions or comments? Any public comment? No, pub no public left. Item 5.05, 
Also a review item, the Hebron Harmon Elementary School Telecommunication Transmission Facility. Yeah. Any board questions or comments? Madam President, could I allow our guest to uh, introduce himself Absolutely. as well from uh, Milestone Communications? Hello, my name is David Goldsmith. I am the project manager for Hebron Harmon Elementary School tele Telecommunications Tower. We used to have a lot of public come out when we had these on the agenda. So I'm sorry, we, you don't have a fan club today. Sorry. Right. Any public comment? All right. Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Okay. It says dollar amount estimated income C attached. Yes, ma'am. So on the uh, second page of your exhibit, uh -huh. under background, you'll see that um, under item one background, last uh, two sentences, it says that under the agreement, Milestone will share 40% of all revenue or $13,440 per year per carrier to Anne Arundel County Public Schools. In addition to that, under determining conditions of the master agreement, there is a one-time $25,000 site access fee for the uh, base station and pole, as well as $5,000 one time for each carrier. The pole is constructed uh, to support up to five carriers. The initial uh, entry will be by uh, one carrier only. Should additional carriers utilize that pole, there will be additional $5,000 one-time fees uh, for that. So that's the fiscal overview. But my question is, you know, estimated income. Is this basically something brand new or this was built before? From what I understand, it goes back to 2012. So well, have, we, have we made a lot of money? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, so this is for another, uh, another installation. We already have uh, installed uh, telecommunication towers at a number of other schools uh, here in the district. Okay. And we're, uh, we're continuing to look at opportunities elsewhere working with Milestone uh, as our partner and with the commercial carriers. Okay, thank you. All right. The last item on the agenda are consent items 6.01 and 6.02. These are information to action items. Do I have a motion to bundle those two and move them from information to action? Move. All those in favor? We now have an action item. Dr. Orlato, your recommendation. Yes, ma'am. I recommend that the Board of Education award contracts as listed on today's agenda 6.01 and 6.02. So Second. Are there, are there any board comments or questions? Mrs. Hummer? The oil spill cleanup, is any of that covered by insurance? Uh, no, ma'am. It is not. We're self insured. Uh, so if it, if it is on, for example, one of our uh, construction projects mm -hmm. and a contractor was to create or initiate, uh, his or her insurance would certainly cover that. But if it's at one of our existing schools that, you know, is under our care and control and it's our oil in our tank and there's a, a spill, that's our obligation. Thank so you. if, but if it is externally created, somebody external to the school district, then certainly we would pursue their insurance carrier uh, to undertake that. But we're self-insured, so it comes out of the, uh, the fund balance that Ms. Uh, Burge elected to, uh, um, alluded to earlier. Is there any public comment? All those in favor? Motion passes 700. Uh, I have a couple of, of announcements. Before um, you say the announcements, can I say something? Terry and I, don't, don't leave Alex, because this is something that Terry and I, we were talking to, yeah, yes, no, 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 it was something good. Terry and I were talking about it at the MABE conference, and that has to do with the solar panels. If you put the solar panels, it was with Solar City, they are also doing like the same thing as these poles are doing. Yes, they are paying you to generate electricity which can be used for the school plus the sale, the sellable yeah. part of it. So we thought, you know, that would be something to look into so that we can save in energy or pay our own energy and at the same time make money and get paid back. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we do routinely take a look at that. Uh, this Board of Education, prior to your arrival on the board, 
uh, approved a contract for us to control to construct a solar farm on land that we own up in Pasadena. Uh, that project is under construction, so it's not the small panels; it's literally acres of yes, panels. Acres so of we're in, we're in fact doing that very thing, not with the firm you mentioned, but with one of their competitors. Okay, because Queen Anne was the county that is doing it. We were just talking. To right. So yes, we okay. we pursue that as as well, and we continue to explore opportunities in that avenue. Good business practice. We're making money. Thank you. Flory, we, we just wanted to make sure you got an extra dose of school board today. <laughs> we'll carry you into retirement. All right, we... <laughs> no. The next... Yes, that's right. <laughs> the next Board of Education meeting is Wednesday, November 2nd at 10. The next Board Policy Committee meeting is Wednesday, October 26th at 1. And the next Board Budget Committee meeting is Wednesday, November 16th at 4.30. Um, Mrs. Hummer. Okay. I move to close the meet to go into closed session to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to negotiations. All those in favor? Aye. All right, we're back in closed session. Thank you all. There we go.